saying tonight. Today's Conservation Commission meeting for Thursday, February 9th, 2023, taking place in the Wakoyat meeting room, Mashpee Town Hall, 16 Great Neck Road North. Um, our meeting is being broadcast live on local cable channel 18, and it is also being streamed live on the Town of Mashpee website. Before we begin, if you would please join me in a pledge of allegiance to the flag. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment uh, in silence for all of the victims of the recent earthquake tragedies in Turkey and Syria, uh, including the loss of several American lives. Thank you. Well, welcome to our open forum. Uh, we have been looking forward to hearing public comment uh, in terms of our water quality agenda. We've been running this agenda now for several meetings, and uh, we, 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 we wanted to take the time to reach out to all the residents to hear what you have to say, hear your concerns. Uh, so this first part of our meeting will run very much like the public comment agendas that the select board has. Uh, each person that has signed up for public comment uh, will call you forward. Please introduce yourself and your address for the record. Uh, our assistant agent, Dan, will be timing you to a three minute uh, window of time. If you go one or two seconds over, I think you'd be okay with that. Uh, and then we'll go on to the next person. Once all of the comment is given, I will open it up to a discussion of the conservation commissioners. Before we do begin, I, I know I see a lot of people here that I haven't seen before, and I oftentimes get questions from people in Mashpee about the conservation commission, what it is and what it does. And sometimes there's misconceptions out there. Uh, this is a seven member voting commission, and we have two associate commissioners that are non-voting unless they uh, come into a meeting where we need them for a quorum and then they have the power to vote. Um, all the commissioners are, they put in a letter of request and then they're appointed by the select board. Uh, we take our authority from a, a whole range of sources. Everybody has heard the term Massachusetts Wetlands Protection, Chapter 131, Section 40, and that is the main source of our authority. But there are many other areas where conservation commissions uh, not only get their authority, but proceed and have a process. Uh, here in Mashpee, we have the Wetlands Bylaw, Chapter 172. It's a bylaw, and it's also a list of regulations. And there seems to be a misconception about that particular chapter. The bylaw itself, and I believe there are 12 parts to that bylaw, those bylaws, if they are going to be changed and amended, those go to town meeting and those get voted on. It's the bylaw. The regulations do not have to go to town meeting. They come under what's called Massachusetts Home Rule Authority, where this commission under a subcommittee, a bylaw review subcommittee, will review those regulations, and if they feel as though they need to be updated and changed, they will make those recommendations to the full commission. It will then go to a public hearing, a public comment, comes back, the commission will look at it and vote on it, then it has to go before town council to be reviewed, and at some point, if everything in there is good, then it becomes law. Um, Recently, in fact, uh, on Friday, I saw an article in the paper, and uh, people are starting to say that, oh, well, they're going to change regulations to circumvent the voters in Mashpee. That, there can't be anything further from the truth. What we're looking at is, and we all know this, we have some serious issues in Mashpee that need to be addressed. Um, I look at the regulations, and 
the average life on those regulations is like 15 plus years. If you have rules that are 15 years old and you're trying to apply those to the situations that you currently have, they just might not work. And so that's why we do look at them. And recently we've, we've updated and changed Regulation 12, which is mitigation. We've also done Regulation 27 on docks, piers, and floats. Tonight we're going to be talking about Regulation 5, which is the, the fees that people pay to come here, and also Regulation 30, which is a nutrient loading regulation. So we take our job seriously. All these commissioners have these big, thick binders. I know I was coming in tonight, and somebody said, can I carry that for you? I said, oh, no. No, you can't touch that. Uh, and it, it's a tough job. There's a lot going on here. But uh, that's a little bit about us, and we'd certainly like to hear from you. So if I could get the, um, the list, Brian, could you grab? Right here. Oh, oh you have yeah. it already. Yeah. Oh, perfect. One step ahead of me. So I'm going to open this up and listen to what you folks have come to share with us. The first person I will call up is Nicole Corbett. Is Nicole here? Yes, she is. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I just have a couple of slides. We just want to make sure that when, you, when everybody comes up, you're speaking clearly into the mic. Because yeah. when we have a hybrid meeting, it's hard for people on Zoom to hear unless you're talking right into the mic. Understood. Um, I just have a flyer I want to hand out to you guys. I tell stories kind of through pictures. So. Sure. Um, Great. Thank you. So much. Thanks. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Nicole Corbett. I am the founder of the Papanesset Water Stewardship Alliance. My family's address is 58 Monahansett Road in Mashpee. Um, this alliance is a small grassroots in citizen science and education group in Papanesset. While we mostly focus on water quality issues pertaining to Nantucket Sound, Papanes Bay and Wakoit Bay are very familiar to me. My family has been in Mashpee for over 60 years, and I have grown up alongside Mashpee's waters, particularly the waters right along the coast. I have loved exploring these waters, both above and below the surface. They are, in large part, what inspire my love for environmental science, both because of their beauty and wonder they hold, but also what was tarnishing said beauty. Mashpee's water quality issues are not new, nor are the causes of said issues. I grew up knowing about these issues well, and my science fair projects in high school were inspired by the nitrogen and phosphorus pollution impacting Papanesset Bay. The media coverage of these issues also is not new. When I was in graduate school, after writing a few papers for my classes about Papanesset, two of my professors handed me copies of the Boston Globe, where an article had been published about a battle over an oyster farm in one of the most polluted bays in Massachusetts, asking if this was the place that I had detailed. I went to graduate school at UMass Boston. Papanesset Bay, oh, excuse me, Papanesset Bay was gaining a reputation many miles away. Since then, many articles have come out detailing the plight of Papanesset Bay and the Mashpee River and other water bodies in Mashpee. It's totally gone. Water quality reaches all-time lows. And algal blooms causing habitat degradation in Papanesset Bay are some of the articles that have graced headlines over the past few years. A toxic stew on Cape Cod is the latest of these headlines. Take a boat ride around Papanesset Bay, and one can see and smell a lot of what is detailed in the New York Times article. The area around Papanesset Island persistently smells like sulfur, a result of the hydrogen sulfide released from decomposing algal blooms just off the island. Last summer, the Barnstable Clean Water Co Coalition and I took a ride around Papanesset Bay to see if we could get some benthic photos and seaweed samples. What we encountered was several feet of black sludge on the north and west sides of Papanesset Island, right in front of the yards of several homes. The sludge all was decomposing macroalgae, and it was so thick, our nets and cameras were getting stuck. On top of the sludge was another two feet or so of Gracilaria tigvahiae, and that's the image right at the bottom of your picture, uh, uh, flyer. This is a seaweed species that glooms, ex glooms exclusively in eutrophied waters, another good indicator that the area is environmentally dead. Other areas of the bay, heading away from the island, have little to no beneficial algae or seaweed species, but they're rather dominated by nuisance natives and invasive species that, that thrive in nutrient-rich, warm waters. One body of water that has not received as much attention is Nantucket Sound, 
Under the pretense of the solution to pollution is dilution, Nantucket Sound is considered an uncompromised body of water. For the past 15 years, Papanessa Bay, a beach, has been experiencing persistent macroalgae or seaweed blooms all year long. These blooms consist um, exclusively of invasive species that studies have shown thrive in high nutrient runoff and warm waters, thrive in areas of high nutrient runoff and warming temperatures. These blooms decompose along the shoreline and create nearshore water conditions that are similar to those of the worst areas of Papanessa Bay. I am asking that the health of Mashpee's waters be on the, put on the forefront of priorities for this town. The conditions are getting worse and in some cases are approaching a tipping point that may not be easy to reverse. Last year, Mashpee adopted a new town seal with the Mashpee River running right down the center, which represented a connection to the town's environment and the natural resources. To me, this seal also represents a commitment and a promise by the town to protect these resources, to be stewards of the environment and our waters. I am looking, hoping going forward, we can uphold this commitment. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, and then some of the images, um, the other two on the top of that are from Papanessa Beach, right on the spit side. So Great. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, terrific. We all want to make comment, but the chairman's told us if we do, he's gonna send us out into the car. Go out in the car and march. So <laughs> for you. Our next speaker is Marge Heck. Good evening, everyone. Hi there. I'm here speaking for Envision Mashpee, which is a grassroots group with a mission to preserve the unique character of our town. Our primary concerns are cleaning our waters, providing affordable housing for the people who live and work here year round, and slowing excessive growth. We support the long delayed sewer system for Mashmi, and we're committed to seeking more state, federal, and private support to help local residents pay for sewers. We support the articles on your agenda on prevention of pollution and the expansion of the buffer zone in wetland areas. We recognize that we inherit the current environmental situation, which the New York Times termed a toxic stew, from the unbridled construction boom of previous decades, which ignored adequate infrastructure. It is time now to moderate this process and put the future of Mashby above the aim of maximizing private profits. We need housing that workers and families can afford, not McMansion behemoths on the waterfront with multiple bedrooms and bathrooms that are turned into vacation Airbnbs, with no regard for the resulting additional effluent. This type of construction contributes nothing to the solution. It only adds to the problem. It is possible to find creative solutions to balance the need for additional housing, sewers, and the economy. This is something we're working on. We need to get the proposed clean water articles on the warrant for this coming town meeting. I believe we have the support of most Mashpee residents, and I think it's our views that should be listened to, not those of the few who oppose these measures. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ken Marsters. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Ken Marsters. I've lived in Mashpee for 36 years, and I'm here also to, pro to talk about the proposed wetland uh, buffer zone. Um, from what I understand, and I may give you some misinformation, because I don't know much about it, haven't heard much about it, and I'm in the business. I'm, and I'm probably going to be the only guy here that's going to try to defend the current article, because not too many people who own these properties are aware of what's going on. I know we have a public hearing. It's produced in the Mashpee Messenger. But 
you know, or the TV here between you and I, how many people read the messenger or watch our meetings, you know? Um, most of these people might be second homeowners and might be out of town or they're just not informed. Um, so I just wanted to understand why, why is it we need it? I think everybody painted with a br uh, broad brush. And so I'm trying to think, what's the rationale? What do I think the rationale is that everybody's thinking? Will it increase open space? Well, if it's 50 lots and you increase the no-build zone by 25 feet over 50 lots, you've increased 2.87 acres of open space for the whole town. There's 14,894 square feet of open space in the town. 560, 560, 50 of it, 38% is open space. Now, if you want to decrease the nitrogen going, in, nitrogen going into the wetlands, remember, um, does anybody really know how far a septic system is typically under the current laws to the, to the wetlands? And I didn't. I'm saying this, I, I just found it out myself. Does anybody know if nitrogen gets all the way from the wetlands, uh, from septic into the uh, wetlands? Before town water was uh, presumed we, uh, on board, we had a distance of 150 feet from septic to well. So in other words, you could do your thing, and 150 feet later, you could have a potable well. That's science. Because once we did that, all of our water met all of the EPA standards. So we were doing, uh, drinking water from wells 150 feet apart. So um, I just have just recently done two lots on, on Lakeshore, and I have some other areas. The distance to the septic to the wetlands is a minimum 150 feet during the current regulation. Most of my lots are 240 feet. So why can't that water from that septic, if it permeates, if it's good enough to drink, and I'm not a scientist, okay, but it must be good enough to go into our wetlands. I haven't heard of a problem that we've had with any of our wetlands right now that have been polluted. I don't know. I mean, I've been in town for 36 years, and 30 years I've been on town boards, zoning board, select board, and water commissioner. And during all that time, and I'm a builder, okay, full disclosure, I'm a builder. I have inherited a problem that we needed to address with our wetlands. And I, um, so why don't we take a simpler approach? Is it a, is a no build? Are we trying to take away building? Is this a no building or is it really what we're talking about, something for the environment? Why don't you just require a uh, denitrification septic system? Right? We take care of the major enemy is the stormwater runoff. We put that into dry wells. We can make these houses nitrogen uh, free if you really want to. And as far as building McMansions, that was three minutes. Let me, let me, let me, end, let me, let me end it. And I was talking fast, too, you know? Let me end with this thing about this is McMansions. Not a you just I know. And I had more. Because let me just say, say the thing about McMansions, okay? And this is, this is, I think you have to hear it from me because I'm a builder, right? Right now, what we typically build in the market right now is a 2,500 square foot ranch. You make that blueprint lower. So in order to make a, I'm going to use a dirty word for this conservation profit, a builder is going to have to go build up into the second floor. So he's going to go up to the second floor, he's going to build out over his garage, so instead of having a 2,500 square foot ranch, you're going to have a 20, 4,500 square foot McMansion with more bathrooms and more people doing what they typically do there. So it sort of could backfire on you in a way too. And just a few questions if you don't mind. Does this article affect existing homes in any further additions on, on, on them? Are any special permits grandfathered like they are for zoning? Um, will they be grandfathered? So um, that's more, that's, I've used all my three minutes. I got more, but I think I hit all my three points. And thank you for allowing me to take extra time. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, we're I, saving all questions at the end, right? Yes. Uh, our next speaker is Irene Chekanoch. Did I pronounce that right? Chekovich. Chekovich. Not too bad. Sorry. <laughs> this may serve as a counterpoint. <laughs> um, Irene Chekovich, Sunset Strip. First, I want to thank you for holding this public hearing. And I also want to thank each of you for your time and service on this very important committee. Um, based on the report written by consultants hired by the town of Mashpee to address the degrading water quality within Santuit Pond, where many of their findings could be applied to all waterways, we know that one, ideally and at a minimum, fertilizer use should be restricted within 300 feet of the water. Two, adequate vegetated buffers are critical in helping to reduce fertilizers and other pollutants from entering our waterways. 
Three, stormwater runoff into our waters should be minimized or eliminated wherever this is occurring. These findings appear in the Acom report published in July 2010, over 12 years ago. And sadly, fertilizer restrictions close to our waterways have still not been increased. Um, we are only just now discussing an increase in vegetated buffers alongside our waterways. And some or all of the sites identified in that report for stormwater management improvements have yet to be corrected. There is a myth being promoted by some town leaders that sewers alone will fix our waters, so no action beyond sewering is needed. However, for those who are listening to the experts and reading report findings, we know that that's just not true. So assuming, as I do, that the ACOM experts knew what they were talking about, and assuming that today's consultants, Fuss and O'Neill, are equally knowledgeable um, about uh, what they are also recommending, the exact same recommendations. And knowing that over the last 12 years, all of our waterways have declined, my question is a simple one. To you and all town leaders and department heads and the voters, I am here tonight to ask one question. What on earth are we waiting for? As the commission charged with the protection of our community's natural resources, at least according to the town's website, you are in a unique position to help. Whatever you can do to proactively support, endorse, and promote initiatives that would further reduce or prohibit fertilizer use, increase the size of vegetated buffers by our waterways, and encourage the remediation of areas where stormwater runoff is threatening our waters, I sincerely hope that you will do though do so. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this evening and for whatever additional actions you can take in the future to help heal our waters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our sure next speaker. <laughs> We're going to put it in the bank. <laughs> our next speaker is Don McDonald. Here to listen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Raul Luzardi. Good evening for the record, Raul Luzardi from Cape Analysis Engineering at 800 um, Falmouth Road. Um, I just, this is the first time I'm looking at the draft and reading it over. A um, couple of weeks ago, I just had some comments and I don't know that this draft, um, kind of address them, but just want to make sure that um, we're either all clear or um, understand what the draft or the eventual changes are going to be. Um, so my two questions will be, these buffer zone expansions, they are going to be expansions to wetlands as defined by MASHPE, not strictly wetlands defined by DEP, Wetland Protection Act. Um, and kind of a follow up on that one, um, there is going to be a 75-foot natural buffer strip to land subject to coastal storm flowage, which is just the flood zone, the A zones, the V zones. Are we applying a 75-foot um, natural vegetated buffer strip to a flood zone? Um, just some clarifications on that, because based on what I just read, it looks like there will be. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Susan Dangle. Good, Good evening. Susan Dangle, 762 Katuit Road. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and it's great to see so many people here concerned about our waters. Um, I'm the president of Save Mashby Wakeby Pond Alliance and a new member of the Mashby Ponds Coalition. So a group of us are together to really focus on freshwater. And these two bylaws um, that affect the buffer strip and the um, vegetate non, I don't even know how to say that thing, the vegetated buffer strip, um, are critical to the ponds, particularly because it seems as though between intermunicipal agreements and locations of our ponds, sewering for the ponds is a long way away. There's really, um, it's really going to fall on the people to take 
personal responsibility uh, on their own properties, but also to restrict development, further development on them and protect as much as we can the nutrients. Um, I echo exactly what Irene said. I couldn't have said another thing. Um, but I did go to the sewer commission this morning or this afternoon, and I spoke about communication. And the gentleman um, who, who said, I don't know what's happening, a lot of people don't know what's happening. Um, if you're on a, a, a committee, you're going to find out. But if not, we really, really need to get an education campaign out. And I am here to say that my group at Save Mashpee and Mashpee Ponds Coalition, and I think Mary Adams Alexak is here from Mashpee Clean Waters, we stand ready to get the word out to help educate the community between now and May. And furthermore, as we've seen in some cases, um, even though a, an article makes it to the warrant, sometimes the select board chooses not to vote it at town meeting at the last minute. So as a result, our groups have put forth three, um, a horsepower um, regulation for Santuit Pond and um, citizens' petitions for Chapter 172, the um, 100 to 150 feet, and the 172-7-A-1. Right. Um, so <laughs> they, are, <laughs> they are in. Um, we, we submitted them today. I'm proud to say that those will stand in support of what you're going to put forth. And in case they get pulled off the warrant, ours are going to be there. Thank you very much. Good strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mary Adams Oleksak. Mary Adams Oleksak, 18 Capstan Circle. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing and thank you for all you're doing. Uh, Despite the earlier comment that um, sewering isn't the only thing we should do, it is a in very important part. And I think we're all right now on tender hooks waiting to see what happens with the proposed DEP regulations. I know that's not part of your purview, but I think it would give us a lot of clarity as a town um, to have a, a very clear plan about how we are going to tackle the nitrogen issue across the town. Um, one of the challenges that we've seen that's so frustrating about this are, is that uh, water quality and environmental quality is such an interdisciplinary problem. And you're, in some ways, we're preaching to the choir. You, you're taking care of um, some very important aspects of the challenge, uh, but it, it requires such teamwork. And I don't know if the town has an answer to that yet of how to keep things coordinated. Um, I, I won't go into the specifics, but, you know, I support, I, you know, I, I think most people know me. I, I was kind of the catalyst that started Mashpee Clean Waters. It's a grassroots effort. It's really an ongoing conversation. We have over 700 people on, on Facebook, and it's, a, it's a, I think, a pretty good, thoughtful, um, active group. Um, and I think most folks support continued regulation and continued thinking. And, and I, I um, thank you for your point, uh, Chairman Colombo, that, that we have to keep adapting the regs to the reality. But I, I want to challenge you that one of the biggest problems I see is compliance and the learning part, as, as Sue mentioned. Um, compliance, uh, you know, you, you have the opportunity at key moments to really influence what happens, and, and these regulations provide a really good base for that. But we all know that what happens later is that people do what they want, they, they circumvent what, what they've been required to do. And part of it is out of perhaps arrogance, but some of it's out of ignorance. And so one of the things that we're continuing to challenge ourselves, Sue mentioned it, I mean, Sue found this amazing program that we're going to try to replicate um, to, to teach citizens to be stewards of the land and, uh, and the waters. Uh, we're not there yet. Um, and, you know, I, I often remember 
what Dr. Brian House said to me early on when we were talking about the first uh, phase one of the wastewater. He said, it takes citizens, it takes town leaders, and it takes scientists. And uh, I think what, what today demonstrates is that we have citizens that stand ready to support you, and, and we want to be part of the solution. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Our next speaker is Lynn Barbie. Uh, Lynn Barbie, Surf Drive. Um, I'm great. I was really happy to hear Nicole. I see her pictures on the internet all the time, and they make me cry. Uh, and I don't live on Papanesset, but um, I, I just want to say that I know there are people in this room who've lived here many, many, many decades. That is not me. But in the time I have lived here, which is a little over a decade, I have seen the changes to our water. And I think the other thing that we're not really factoring in here is the whole question of climate change exacerbating everything. So we can't keep doing what we've been doing, and we can't just make little tiny fixes. We need big fixes. We, got, we should do little ones, but we have to do big ones because we are also, look, I'm looking at the picture here of the rising sea levels and the erosion on New Seabury Coastal Bank. We have to add the uh, impact of climate change on all of the things that we're trying to do and do more and better. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mary Wagan. Good evening. Good evening. Mary Good evening. Wagan, 35 of Schumacher Road, Ashby. I again commend the Conservation Commission and our conservation staff for continuing to prioritize this important work to clean up the polluted waters of Mashpee. I'm very proud that we're sewering the town but I encourage you to continue to use every tool in the toolbox to get our waters clean again. I want to thank the chair for explaining the process which is used to amend your regulations. This is the same process used by the planning board. We have uh, rules and regulations regarding the subdivision of land. The way we change them is we have discussion, we write up the change, we hold a public meeting, um, a public hearing, which is uh, legally uh, put into the newspaper so that everybody has the opportunity to know about it. And then the planning board votes on that. And it's a simple majority of the planning board. Why do we change regulations? Because things change. The last speaker just noted what the huge impact of climate change is going to have on us as time goes on. We need to change things to address that. I'm sure when the first developments went in to Mashpee during the building booms of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, nobody thought we would end up with a toxic stew of water. But now we do. We didn't have adequate infrastructure. And as we install our infrastructure, we have to use, again, every tool in the toolbox going forward. Um, I've read your changes proposed for Regulation 30, Prevention of Pollution. I think they're scientifically based. I like them and I support your passage of them. I do have a master's in environmental science, so when I'm reading your parts per million, when I'm figuring out how you, you know, set those, I can say that they're reasonable and they're logical. And what I like about them the most is that they not only address the need to clean up our waters, they also allow property owners to, till, to still develop and improve their property. It's not a, a building moratorium, right? It's a balanced approach. Um, I do hear that some people say, well, that's, you know, it's, that's going to make Cape Cod not Cape Cod anymore, right? If we don't allow these developments the way they've always been allowed. Well, I have to say that nothing is more Cape Cod than clean water. So again, I thank you Put for... <laughs> I think I will. <laughs> and I, again, thank you for all your leadership on this important matter. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Mary. 
<coughs> Our next speaker is Margie Ross Dector. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Hi there. Um, my name is Margie Ross Dector, and I own a, own he, a home here in Mashpee, and I'm representing the board of Save Pompanesa Bay, of which, who, on whose board I've served for over 10 years. We first want to thank the Conservation Commission for raising awareness of the critical dangers facing Pompanesa Bay, and we urge you and our community support to make strides to improve the sustainability of our bay. Save Pompanesa Bay was founded by neighbors in and around Pompanesa Bay in 1987, which to do the math was 26 years ago. And our board is a 501c3 nonprofit that is 100% volunteer, staffed, and financially supported by neighbors in and around Mashpee. The mission of Save Pompanesa Bay is to preserve and protect the Pompanesa spit for generations to come. The spit, for those of you who don't know, is the barrier peninsula and endangered species habitat which forms and protects Pompanesa Bay and is owned by Save Pompanesa Bay and Mass Audubon, which safeguards the endangered species habitats such as our beloved less terns and piping plovers. Over the years, the board of SPB has raised millions of dollars, that's millions, uh, to support and sustain the Pompanesa spit in the bay, including hiring coastal engineers, securing permits, and procuring sand to ensure Pompanesa Bay's channels are safe and navigable, and to rebuild dunes and beach destroyed by coastal erosion. The town of Mashpee and its economy has benefited enormously from our efforts in terms of recreation, boating, clamming, moorings, and housing, and is reflected in the coastal zone management grant we submitted with the town of Mashpee. We spent many hours interacting with the town of Mashpee, the state and federal agencies, and have won large coastal grants and environmental awards for our coastal and dune restoration projects. We also coordinate and subsidize dredging through Barnstable County Dredge, both by maintaining permits and paying for the dredge sand that helps restore the beach. Through this process, SPB has successfully established that the channel has a right to exist and holds the permits to dredge the channel. As a result, our efforts for water quality and safe navigation have helped preserve and protect Mashpee's treasured bay. We are really moved by the show of support um, that this room has shown and the town has shown about the future of Pompanesa Bay and, of course, the spit. We wanted to say that we stand ready to join you, our elected leaders and neighbors, to do what we can to support the Pompanesa spit, the bay, so that it's sustainable for years to come. Please let us know how we can be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We now have three Margies in the yeah. room. I just want to say. <laughs> very unusual. Wow. My mother's very good taste. What's that? We also have a few participants that are online, so I'm going to move over to those folks. I just I don't have their names through. So, so is there a, a Kathy Kramer on the line? Bob Hughes. Is there a Bob Hughes on the line? Yeah, hi, I just got in. Oh, hi, Bob. Thank you. We're taking public comment. If you want to um, have, any, if you have any comments to the commission, uh, not at this at this point, no. Okay. Uh, is there a Joan on the line? I don't have a last name. Is there a Joan on the line? I think that's it. It? Yeah. yeah. There were some uh, chats that were coming in about a difficulty uh, trying to get audio, and I displayed the number to call. So, but I don't. No uh, I don't know if anyone was successful in getting okay. on. So. Okay. Um, is there anyone who came in late and did not get a chance to sign up? Somebody that we might have missed? No. We're good. Okay. Well, again, thank you all of you who have come to express your concerns. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the individual commissioners for anything that they would like to say. I'll just go one by one. If you want to volunteer to go first, I'll recognize you and we'll take it from there. I'll be happy to go. Marjorie Kleberut. I want to add to all the Marjories that are here <laughs> and all the non-Marjories. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be uncharacteristically brief. I really just want to thank you all so much. I know you're busy. You have stuff to do. We all do. But to have you here tonight and to know that you're going to continue to be there for getting the word out, major league education, 
that something that this commission and, and all uh, who work for the town in a volunteer or elected capacity, it's, it's tough to get people to come out and to vote at a town meeting or at a hearing. So thank you, number one, for that. And number two, thank you especially um, for passing on the education. We talk here at the commission and so many other places. I feel so grateful to have the benefit of all the knowledge that's around this table. But uh, so many of you, um, I forget who it was. I think, Mary, it might have been you preaching to the choir. And in some sense, we are, all of us here. Um, but it gives us the opportunity, each one of us, to go out and speak to another 10 people, because it is going to be an engagement. And I've been coming down here forever, and I am going to be here forever. And my grandchildren want to swim and play in the spit and see the piping plovers. And I don't care who makes fun of me for that. I want it all to be clean and there for you and for everyone. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you to all my colleagues for being here, too. Thanks, Marjorie. Anyone else that would like to speak? We're good? Oh, I have more to say. You want me to? No. I'll, I'll go. <laughs> Brian? Um, yeah. Wanina Khan, Natasuiz Moskota, New Tomas Masipia, Kana Tai Masipia. I said good evening. My name is Berhart. I come from Mashpee, and I live in Mashpee. Um, Brian Whedon, also um, not only a commissioner, but also the chairman of the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe. Um, we just attended the USET conference, which is United South and Eastern Tribes. It's for all of the federally recognized tribes within that area, over 30 tribes that are part of the organization. Um, our tribal youth attended and uh, participated in a group participation and edu educational experience called Close Up, um, where they learned about, you know, how Congress works, you know, the federal government, so on and so forth, and the trust responsibilities that we have. Um, the, each tribe got to do an initiative, and our tribal youth did an initiative on water quality. And I really like for them to come and do that presentation and to show you, because that's what they want to do, not only in the tribe, but also in the town. Um, also at that conference on Tuesday, I had a chance to meet with Senator Warren um, and introduce her. And I made sure that that was the question that I asked her about her commitment to the water quality issues. And I think that we not only need to hold the state accountable, but the federal government accountable as well. Um, so just wanted to reiterate that, um, you know, Mashpee and Wampanoag go hand in hand, just as our, our name, Masipi, means the place of the great waters. And I don't think our waters are so great anymore. Um, you know, and that's sad for our future generations. But it's beautiful to see that our young people are watching and our young people are engaged as well. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that. Um, and we did have the senator's commitment. Um, so now we have to hold, you know, everyone accountable and we'll use every, you know, capacity and, you know, powers that be um, to make sure that, you know, they commit those promises. Um, and that way we're taking care of it for the future generations because, you know, I have a son and he's one years old and, you know, he can't really swim in these waters nowadays. Um, I remember growing up here as well as everyone else around this room. So thank you for coming and I appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. Anyone else that would like to speak? I can go. Okay, um, Alex. Yeah, first I echo Marjorie and Brian thanking everybody for coming. Um, there are two more specific things that I do want to speak to. Um, when it comes to the buffer zone enhancements, um, last meeting uh, it was brought up of how, how would that work if it's a bylaw and it's not a state reg? That is not unique, and that would not be unique for Mashpee. Other towns have filings that are through the CONCOM that are only to the bylaw. So that, that's not a unique situation. Falmouth deals with it. They classify wetlands differently than the state does. So they have filings at times that are only bylaw filings, and they, they charge it differently we could create our own, our own um, form that people fill out, that we have flexibility there. So that's not unique. And it was, I think, pitched a little bit that that might be like, oh, us going out on a limb. It's not. Um, we can do that. The other thing, um, I think, you know, it was, it was mentioned last meeting that we do have it within our purview to say no fertilizer on your lawn. And, we can say that as a condition when people come in front of us, and that is a no-cost condition. It, it's not going to cost the homeowner to, not, to, to stop fertilizing their lawn, and it's something we can do, and I would encourage us to do um, for our filings to keep fertilizer out. It's, it's not necessary. If you, don't have, like, if, you don't, if you want a green, luscious space, plant native plants. 
You don't need a lawn. So or that's AstroTurf. Right. Very green. <laughs> no. I'm being funny. I'm sorry. I couldn't help. Um, but yeah, I think I think we can encourage native plantings. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, then I will um, sum up by, again, thanking people that came here tonight. Thank you. Um, this is really not just a one-night uh, engagement that we're having. We've talked uh, several times at many of our meetings about reaching out to the community, to the people, to educate people as to who we are, what we do, and the importance of our role as stewards of Mashpee's environment. Uh, there was a speaker that came up tonight, uh, Ken, Ken Masters, who said, you know, I wasn't aware of this. And I've heard this many, many times. And if you're not watching Mashpee TV, and some people don't, I do. I, I watch all the meetings that I can't physically come to. Uh, if you're not reading the papers, well, then you're kind of not plugged in. And the word has to get out. And somebody mentioned tonight, uh, I'm so glad that these groups are here that can help us to reach out to the citizens, residents here of Mashpee. Um, we do need an all-out effort to communicate to everyone what, what we do and the importance of what we're trying to do. Um, this is not something that we're here to you know, make a, a take, a regulatory take of one kind or another. We're here to help the environment. And I haven't been here for decades either. Somebody said I've only been here for one decade, not like a lot of people in the room. Uh, and I've seen such a tremendous degradation of water quality in this town, the short period of time that I've been here. Um, we are in a serious situation. And we look at these regulations that we have, and they have to be changed. They have to be adapted and upgraded to meet the challenges of today. Um, so we're going to continue that process uh, even tonight. We're going to be talking about articles and regulations that we've been working on. Um, you're all welcome to stay and continue along with us in this meeting. We'll start some of our hearings for uh, construction proposals that have come before the commission at 6. But we have about 10 minutes or so that we could take some pre and post items. Um, I did sure. a couple of things just to add sure. on to the public discussion, too. Because <clears throat> I, I did hear some questions that were uh, asked of the commission during the public comment. One of them, uh, Ken Marsters had asked about, uh, does the article, the draft article for the expansion of the buffer zone impact existing homes? Uh, and what about grandfathering of existing conditions? So we have hard copies of the regulatory language uh, up on the desk there. And you can take a look at it. It does address those questions. They're not in, yeah, yeah, right up there. There's two sets, 172-2 and 172-7A1. Um, so you can take a look at those. They're still in draft form. And uh, I think it'll answer those questions that you have. Um, and uh, Alex had already, I think, addressed this question. Uh, Raul is already um, that, uh, yes, there will be bylaw, there will be bylaw only filings. And we do have uh, templates to work off of to create our own bylaw forms when it comes to um, the expanded buffer zone. So just to answer those specific questions. Mr. Chairman, could I just add one more thing before? Sure. While well, everyone is still here. We have eight minutes. <laughs> Would you say I have eight minutes? Well, you don't. <laughs> that's a, that, you know, that's just such a risky thing for you to say. <laughs> for people in the room that know me, they know why that is. Um, uh, no, I just want to uh, pick up on the education piece and the outreach because <clears throat> someone had mentioned um, ways in which to convey to neighbors and to others different issues. Uh, some of the things we're going to talk about tonight we're doing internally with your input. Some will be going to town meeting. Some, we hope, as Brian had referenced, we hope get to our legislative delegation and our congressional delegation. There's just so much there. <coughs> the word campaign <coughs> keeps coming to me. Um, I'm a former member of the House of Representatives here. It's one of the things that got me really interested, not only in conservation, but a lot of other things. And I learned the value of a campaign really being one-on-one. -on -one. It's really not this big thing that scares so many people. It's getting to people in as many ways we can. <clears throat> um, and if anyone's interested in the politics of it, there are 13 ways to do it, and I'll talk to you after the meeting if you'd like. But, but I, I was being facetious and yet... Uh, uh, 
a little serious about bumper stickers. If you in any way can help us, I know Mary, uh, your campaign, I hate to pick on you, but you did it so well with Mashpee Clean Waters, getting the word out, getting the data, when we need you there, please show up, please come vote, and here are seven good reasons why, I think, is what your flyer said. It got me to call you, right? I mean, so, um, if you want to be part of that, if you have good ideas about that, um, please feel free to get in touch with any of us or to go up on the website or to in any way connect because campaign, that's my big word for the night. We can do a lot of these things through yeah. a good organized yeah, grassroots campaign. So I'm so grateful, again, for your being here. So let's, let's do that. Okay. I give you back the last five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to move us along to our pre- and post-hearing agenda items. Uh, the first one we have is a reorganization of... Sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt. It looks like there's people who logged on to Zoom and they're having a hard time with audio, and I don't know if they want to be part of the public oh, comment. Sure, why don't you check with them? I'm just going to put this up here so they can see it. Hopefully they can see Are it. Are they leaving hands. comments in the chat section? They just expressed they just that they were in. having difficulty with ah. audio. So I'm trying to get them to dial in because it looks like they want to say something uh, as far as public comment. I'll give them just a minute or two. Hi, it's RNJ Adler. Can you hear us? RNJ Adler. Can you hear us? Okay. Let's. Yeah. I'm not sure what. Yep. I don't know if they can hear us or not. Hi, RNJ Adler. Can you hear us? Thank you. Okay. Do you have a public comment that you'd like to bring to the commission, or are you here for one of the hearings? Uh, we were going to listen in on the uh, Ashley Conservation Meeting. Right. Uh, for, I assume the first slide is the one that you have up there now, talking about these issues? That's correct. Yeah, we're, we were just wrapping up the public comment period, which started at 5 p.m. and goes till 6 p.m. I see. Um, no, we hadn't been aware that this was part of the public comment period or the end of the public comment period. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. Uh, do you wish to make a, a comment to the commission, uh, just in mm -hmm. regards to? We just want to. Uh, no, we we don't. This is our first uh, listen in. Okay. We we have not attended or known of this meeting until this afternoon. Okay. Um, well, then we're going to move on with the regular hearing agenda, and feel free to stay on if you'd like to uh, listen to uh, the meeting content from here on. Thank you. That would be great. Sure. Okay. It's delightful to have you. Right. <laughs> okay, so we can wrap that up. Yeah. Move on. Okay, so uh, the first item on our pre and post list is reorganization of officers, officer, for the Conservation Commission. Since I assume the chair, we've been operating without a vice chair. And I've been really hoping to get that filled. Not that I want to take a night off, but it's always nice to have a backup. Uh, so I would accept some nominations from the floor of any individuals that would be interested in filling that slot. Mr. Chairman, Hi. I'd like to um, nominate Alex. Alex, so do you accept that nomination, Alex? Um, <laughs> I nominate you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can both be nominated. We can just vote. The enthusiasm is overwhelming. Maybe the others Alex. too. Uh, Brian. Uh, yeah, I'll accept that. Okay. Are there any other nominations? Mr. Chairman, I do want to nominate Brian. You do want to I nominate? I do. Yeah. All right. So now we have two members of the commission that are nominated. Let's all nominate each other. <laughs> are there any other nominations? Can no. we go for three? 
Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'd like to respectfully decline. Ooh. Okay. So we're back to one. All right, then I would um, accept a motion that we call for a vote for Alex Zolo as Vice Chairman of the Conservation Commission. I make a motion to appoint Alex Zolo as the Vice Chairman of the Mashpee Conservation Commission. Thank you, Brian. Is there a second to that motion? I second it. Thank you, Marjorie. Is there any discussion on the motion we have for voting before I take a roll call vote? I think I, I move that we, is it by acclamation or unanimity? Whichever you'd like, can we do that? Unanimous. Make sure the meeting minutes say vice chairwoman, please. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Do we have to go around? I'll go right around the table. And I will start with Brian. Yes. Alex? I'm abstaining. You're going to abstain. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. I vote yes as well. Is Charlie logged in? I'm in, but I, I, I'm having trouble getting on the computer. Okay. Uh, we're taking votes on to nominate Alex Zolo for the uh, vice chair position. Oh, that'd be fine. Okay. I say yes. Okay. Thank you. Yay. Okay, so that motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. And condolences. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so then our uh, administration would be myself as the chairman, Alex as vice chair, and Brian remains clerk. Perfect. Okay. Um, the next thing on our list is the discussion of Mashpee water quality issues, which we've been involved in now for the first hour, so I'm just going to skip over that unless there's something the commissioner wants to add to the discussion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just had the one question that I had sent you by email, but it should probably really be said at, a, at the open meeting, is that at some point, uh, and I'm not sure what the answer is here, um, I think that the commission should have a conversation about whether we're going to take a formal uh, position on uh, two of the issues that have been before us. One, one is a formal response to the New York Times. I just feel as though we just never defended the town of Mastery mm -hmm. uh, and, and laid out how we are looking to address all of the very valid issues that were raised. Um, and the second one is on the, obviously, on the sewer, on the regulations and DEP, and whether we're going to actually take that forward with a formal vote. If it's in order tonight, happy to put it at the end of the agenda. If it's not in order, I'd like to place it on the agenda for the next meeting. Right. I believe we would have to post that we're going to vote yeah. on that. Yes. So we'll... Um, I'll have that on our next agenda item that we will take a formal vote on both of those issues. That would be great. That way the public's notified and they can come and make comment on that and we will take that up. That would be, be on great. February 23rd. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, do you want to do a couple updates, Drew, before we start the first hearing or? Sure. I'll okay. Just I'll turn that over to you. Quick ones. Um, so for the... Uh, <coughs> Red Brick Road culvert, we're still waiting, should be receiving an estimate from Hoysley Witten Group for the planning and permitting phase um, for that uh, particular project, which as you all recall is uh, creating an eight foot wide box culvert uh, and doing stormwater improvements at the Red, to replace the existing failed culvert at Red Brook Road, uh, working with the town of Falmouth on that. Um, and also, uh, you know, ultimately, working on funding uh, to pay for that. So that we need this estimate first so we know when we apply for grants, which there are a couple of them out there that we can take advantage of, we know how much to ask for. Um, so that's still in progress. Uh, there, for the upper quotient restoration permit level plan should be uh, finalized and should be moving into the permitting phase soon. I don't have any other updates on that. And um, I guess I can cover one more here. Um, skipping over to John's Pond and Santua Pond Milfoil. So we were given a, a lot of information, good information from the consultant who um, 
helped us to eradicate a milfoil on John's Pond about what to do about Santua Pond, and I'll be working with the uh, Department of Natural Resources uh, and contacting some groups associated, you know, friends of Santua Pond, uh, and just kind of disseminating information out about what the overall approach is there. It's going to cost more money than we have budgeted for, but we want to get kind of public feedback on that first, so we're still working on that, uh, rolling that out. I'm going to call the first hearing that we have scheduled for tonight. Um, this is for Mark R. and Robin L. Galante, 164 Captain's Row. It is a proposed two-story addition to an existing dwelling. The representative is J. E. Landers Cauley, and this is continued from October 27th of 22 and 11 10 22. It's an amended order of conditions. And Jack Landers is on Zoom. So He's on Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chairman, um, I need to recuse myself because uh, Mark and Robert Galant are clients of mine. Okay. So I'll step out of the room. Thank sure. You. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Jack, can you hear us? One, two, three, four. Jack, can you hear us? I don't think he can hear us. Nope. It's a good thing I got this typed out. Yeah. <laughs> Copy and paste it into the chat, too. number. Jack, can you hear us? Yes. I felt like the tingles when you said that. I was like, yes, thank you. That's what yeah. you need. That was awesome. I didn't realize that when I was meeting with the senator, it was the same day as the State of the Union. It's true. I was already now. Jack, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was bad. Stacy was calling me while I was down there. She calls, like, she calls us to remind us. I was like, yeah, I'm in D.C., but I'm <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. I was talking last night, too, so I'm like, yeah, it doesn't stop. <laughs> I don't know 
what's wrong. Jack, can you hear us? I can hear you now. All right, great. Okay. okay. I apologize for any delay. No worries. Okay. I think we're ready. Okay, Jack, we, we, the chairman called the hearing, so whenever you're ready. Well, good evening. For the record, my name is Jack Landis Colley. I'm a civil engineer in private practice, and Mr. and Mrs. Galante has retained me to prepare the plan that's before you this evening and the request for the amended order of conditions. Um, Drew said he could share the screen to show you what it is we propose. While he's doing that, let me explain what the situation. Um, in the first notice of intent in order of conditions, my client wished to literally pick up the house, take it off the lot, move it diagonally across the street, and then rebuild in almost precisely the same footprint the proposed house. Well, one year goes by, the prices are escalating, and he simply cannot afford building the house, his dream house. So having realized that, he took two huge steps back and he proposed an addition as attached to the, if you're standing in the road facing the house, the left side. Um, do you, can you share the screen, Drew? Uh, I am sharing it right now. Okay, well, I don't see it, That's, but I can do this from memory. Okay. So standing in the road facing the house, we have an addition. That addition is approximately 700 square feet inside. And I, I might add to the, to the commission, the staff asked me today um, to analyze the lot to make sure that we don't exceed the 5,000 square feet that an applicant is entitled to given certain circumstances. And I can answer it this way. We are not altering a permanent alteration that is more than 4,500 square feet. That includes the existing house, the proposed addition of about 700 feet, the 1,440 square feet of existing driveway, a concrete pad, which is about 120 square feet, and then an area that's altered right by the water, which I, I don't know how to describe it as maybe a, a sandy area where people come trans traverse from the upland to the water, which is another 120 square feet. So when you add those all together, the grand total is 4,500 square feet. In the upper left-hand corner of the plan, we actually show some tables. Those tables don't clarify precisely what I just said. They do show um, a couple of things. One, the existing house, um, they do sh that is the square footage. They do show that the proposed addition with the existing deck and the existing house has another um, value about, I think it is 3,000 square feet. And then um, we add on to it the driveway and the two small disturbed areas. So I believe the application follows the intent of the Rivers Act. I believe it's approvable as an amended order of conditions because we're getting no closer. Um, it's a, a modest change of about 700 square feet and I think it's entirely consistent with what is allowed both as an amended order of conditions and what is allowed um, by the Mashpee Conservation Commission. So having said that, if you have some specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess my first question would be, um, does this trigger a required hearing with the CBA? Um, that's a good question. Um, Chris Corain rendered an opinion that it did not. Um, I'm certainly not the zoning expert. I, I know quite a bit about zoning, but to this point, 
Um, I don't believe it requires a ZBA approval. Um, that is based on his review um, of the zoning bylaws and the application at which we're proposing. Um, I also believe that he uh, talked to the building commissioner and got him to concur with his opinion that it doesn't need a ZBA approval. Even if it did, what we would do is we would go to the ZBA, or I should say Chris will go to the ZBA and I would assist him in a, um, uh, in a back, uh, what am I trying to say? I would assist him on the technical issues of his application. But he would, he would be garnering the argument um, as to why it doesn't need a ZBA approval, or if it did, why it should be in, approved. Any other, any other questions? Well, it's it, more of a comment than a question. Um, if it does need filing, we would have to have the appointment. We'd have to have the filing before we could proceed, correct, Drew? Yes, I can, I can only, I'm oh, sorry, Jack, I can only say that based on today's comment from the building inspector, it does not need to go to it the zoning board. No. no. It's an addition okay. by right. It's further than 50 feet outside the wetland. Yeah. So it's, and it's not within land subject to coastal storm flow. Okay. Uh, so it does not require ZBA. I, I, I do believe you have a form also that is required to be Yes. Filled yes. out. So we were informed by the. So that was the vehicle yeah. we used to get before the yeah. building commissioner. Yeah, it's gone through a couple of different iterations, okay. so, but this latest does not trigger. I right. just wanted to cover that base first. Sure. Um, I'll open it up to commissioners that have questions or comments or concerns. I have a question. I'm not sure if it's a gentleman representing the homeowners or if it's to you, Drew, but um, I can't find the Board of Health position uh, on the septic upgrade. Am I missing it or is it not in yet? Um, so it was, I can read the Board of Health comments if you'd like. You, you could read? Yeah. yeah, that would be great. Sure, sure. So Board of Health comments that state that the property is permitted uh, by the Board of Health for three bedrooms. The addition of any habitable space that meets the definition of a bedroom in Title V would be considered an increase in flow. Excuse me. Existing and proposed floor plans to be reviewed upon submission to the building department. A Title V inspection is required whenever a change of footprint is proposed. Note the location of septic system and restrict equipment vehicle traffic over non-load bearing H10 components. Setbacks and access to septic components must be maintained. So, Jack, I don't know if you've had a conversation with Board of Health on this yet, or the homeowner. I, I, I didn't. Um, the uh, designer um, did, and he was told um, that the number of bedrooms shall not increase. Okay. That is our intent. Um, um, if someone thinks otherwise, it's it's um, incorrect. Um, and I can certainly get that affirmation from both the owner and the designer. Okay. But our intent was to keep the same number of bedrooms. Okay. So is that sufficient for the for this commission to pass it forward? Or I mean, because it sort of leaves the the issue of septic a little squeegee, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the, the septic uh, load and any increase in flow and inspections of the interior are, are Board of Health purview. So I would say that for the purposes of the commission, you know, we, you can move on with review, and staff will make sure that things are in compliance with Board of Health. That's, so is that something we need to add as a condition, or is it understood that? It's just understood that that, that they'll have to Health square things to away with Board of Health. Board of Health this is okay and the septic's okay. Correct. And if there's any change if it is an increase in living space, you know, in the opinion of the Board of Health, then it'll probably have to come back to this commission if there's a change in the septic system. So, but all of that gets sorted out. I don't, I don't, just in my opinion, I don't think it should hold up your deliberations for this evening for this, because the board of, it's really Board of Health jurisdiction. Always seems so gray when we overlap with the Board of Health, just as yeah. a point of order. Sure. Uh, because isn't it under our purview, either implicit or explicit, 
to make a determination on the septic. I mean, it's what we're talking about. It's what we're talking about. We're waiting for the DEP to come down on issues of sewers, right. septics, et cetera. It seems a little absurd to just ignore it, set it aside. Well, I don't think it's being ignored. I mean, Board of Health is I don't mean that there. in a pejorative no, way. No, no, I, I understand. But, I mean, Board of Health is aware of this project by virtue of them commenting on it for the purposes of tonight's meeting. So it's not going to be ignored. It'll get sorted out one way or another. I just, I don't think that that, the, la the I guess, the unknown entity of uh, increase in living space. Yeah. Um, it's your call. If you want to continue it to wait for Board of Health comments or if you want to rely on Board of Health to follow up with the property owner, um, that's your call. I don't know what else to suggest, really. It's, it's your call as a commission if you want to wait for Board of Health to have more detailed comments in regard to this or if you're satisfied with the comments that they'll review upon submission to the building department. So I have a comment. Go ahead, um, Go ahead Alex. I think it seems to me that we're going to need to require mitigation plan things for the proposed addition within Riverfront jurisdiction. Um, so why don't we continue it so that to give them a chance to put the mitigation plan things on the plan and hopefully by the time we have our next meeting, the Board of Health will have weighed in and we can kind of do it that way. That's perfectly acceptable to me. I'm wondering if it, if there's something even more direct. Uh, ha have there been other? Um, I seem to recall several other uh, proposals that have been before us that we had to continue. Uh, and it wasn't just the Board of Health. They were the very unknown issues of what the floor plan as approved. And this is the second floor plan for this particular applicant, right? Yes. yes. And so when they come forward with the second, and we don't have that floor plan, and we don't know the square footage, and we don't know how many residents, inhabitants. And I know everybody keeps saying, well, gee, that's not your purview. But in, in essence, anything that has to do with the septic is by virtue of what the Conservation Commission's mission is. So, Alex, I, I'm happy that uh, if that's a continued uh, mitigation or condition or whatever we want to call it of, of putting it forward on a continuance. I'm for that. We do. We but do have a floor plan for this proposal. Well, if, if I could add plan? something yeah, at this moment, um, if we were to increase the number I, of bedrooms, sorry, which is not the one, case, so. oh, hold on. we'd have Jack, to redesign uh, the septic system. We'd Jack, have to go to the Board Jack, of Health. In Jack. fact, we'd have to come back to the Conservation Commission and tell them we're increasing the soil absorption system to accommodate additional flow. The way it's been explained to me is the, the Galantes simply need more elbow space, so to speak, because they want to reside there um, a longer time uh, during the year. And um, they just don't think the structure they have now suits them for any long-term residence at at the property, hence the reason why they were going to build another house at one point. Um, they're not trying to hide anything. Um, I think that the board can, in, in good faith, um, close the hearing and approve it as presented. And quite frankly, our office would never attempt to, to do anything other than be 100% um, um, truthful about um, what they're proposing. Let me just say for the record, I'm not accusing, nor do I have any. Uh, I apologize if you got the impression that I think that you're misrepresenting this. That's not my intent at all. I'm, I'm talking about the lack of information. I see now that I'm missing the floor plan, so I apologize. You did submit the floor plan. Um, and if this is the floor plan with the adjusted square footage, 2,400 and change, and the number of baths, it's going to go to the Board of Health. I will defer to my colleagues here. Uh, is anyone else uh, concerned or? I mean, it's interesting that the new storage room is this bigger than an existing bedroom. Just yeah. throwing that out there. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, these are, the, these are the thorny gray issues, are they not? Yeah. I just wanted to raise it. 
under the heading of due diligence. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I would be fine with um, us making it a uh, condition, I think. When I try to look at, you know, the documents we have before us, one that I like to have in front of me is the one with the agent's comments. And when we try to frame, frame motions, making sure that we're looking at the recommendations from the agent. Um, and it does say in this one that the Board of Health review, um, but there was also recommendations for mitigation. So I think that any time we talk about um, continuing a hearing or anything else like that, we should obviously, you know, talk to the owners and the representatives. Um, but I do think that, you know, it is in our purview to make those conditions and things like that if we so choose. So I just want to reiterate that. I mean, I'm fine with continuing it, but I'm also fine with making them conditions. It's fine with you with the agent's condition and the reference to the Board of Health. And Correct. Just like with the building department, like we've done before, we've done mm -hmm. it before where mitigation plans will come back to, you know, Drew as the agent, um, and then they'll proceed, you know, after that. Or if we want to see them again, you know, obviously mm -hmm. continue, so. I guess my comment is, do we have the proposed mitigation on this proposal? I don't see it. No, it was a suggestion that I put forward because this expansion of um, the, adi the, the addition is taking place within the 50 to 100 foot. Right. Uh, outside, it's outside the 50 foot. So it'll be a one-to-one -one mitigation uh, based on our mitigation regulation 12 uh, and the mitigation chart. So when you're expanding structure over previously disturbed areas within the 50 to 100 foot, uh, setback to wetlands, it requires a one-to-one -one ratio of mitigation. So the plan should be amended to include that mitigation um, somewhere over existing lawn as close to the salt marsh as possible. Well, perhaps the thing to do, um, if I may, is uh, ask for the continuance, uh, come up with a mitigation plan, and at the same time, be certain that the staff has the up-to-date um, architectural plans for the addition, which would depict that there's no increase in number of bedrooms. Okay. Um, that would serve us and my client well, and I think it might expedite, expedite um, the plans in the hearing before the board. Can I ask a question? Erin, sure, go ahead. Um, the, the maple that's gonna be removed, it's 32 feet tall, is that right? And then they're proposing to add these two the four inch place. maples. Right. Just wondering, you know how we, there'll be like a, you have to have a plan where you would maintain the, the plantings for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Do we have something similar to make sure these two maples take hold? And is that, can that be part of it or addressed? Well, we, to make that as condition. we could condition a yeah, three year contract sure of monitoring to make sure that. The mitigation survives. It's a big tree to lose. So I'd like it to is see a big that they, tree. That they take hold and flourish. So, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I did hear from the applicants that they would um, like for a continuance. Um, so, the question is to Drew um, what would that date be in that time? So, this would be. This would be for February 23rd at 6 18 p.m. 6, 18 p.m. All right, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I'd like to make a motion um, for the matter of Mark R. and Robert L. Gallant at 164 Captain's Row to be continued to February 23rd at 6, 18 p.m. I'll second. Okay, thank you, Alex. So the motion is made and second. Is there any further discussion on the motion before I call for a vote to continue? And I'm under the impression that we would have the mitigation plan and hopefully something from the Board of Health by the 23rd. Yes. It's, those are the two issues those that were. Those are the two. And if the mitigation plan can show where the trees are going also. The one-to-one -one ratio. Well, yes, I think and any and all tree. mitigation should be on the plan. Exactly. And I heard, I don't know, I don't think we need this in um, writing, but um, I heard the representative for the homeowner say that they would submit more detailed, uh, either the floor plan or the specs of the home so that we could see clearly where the bedroom okay. is located yes. and how many at the end of the day they're proposing to put in. Okay. All right. So those are the three areas are the of three. interest that we're... Is that okay with you, Brian? 
Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to get it clear what we're looking for, for on this continuance. Okay. Then I will take a roll call vote. Brian? Yes. Thank you. Alex? Yes. Thank you. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Thank you, Charlie. I vote yes as well. Thank you, Motion Jack. carries. Thank you, Jack. Well, thank you for your time. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you very much. Now calling the 603 hearing. This is for Brendan P. Giblin, 90 Pompanesset Island Road. It is a proposed demolition of an existing dwelling and appurtenances, plus construction and maintenance of new single family dwelling, garage with pile supported guest suite above, in ground swimming pool, fencing, pool cover enclosure, new patios landscaping, hardscaping, and a Title V IA septic upgrade. Representative is Cape and Islands Engineering. This is continued from January 12th and January 26th of this year. It is a notice of intent. Good evening. Good evening, Mark Tibb, civil engineer with Cape and Islands Engineering, and Nick Crawford from Crawford Land Management. I'd like to just um, drop something off to Drew first before I start. Sure. Mitigation aspect. All right. What you're receiving now is just a revised hard copy of the mitigation portion of this project. I'm sorry? What you're about to receive now is a revised plan of the mitigation portion oh. of this project, but not the engineer portion. The engineer plan is the same that you have in your binders. Thank you so much. So we are here tonight for the proposal of a raise and replace at 90 Papanesset Island Road. Um, we filed a notice of an a tent application for a single family home, <coughs> deck, porches, uh, a pool, dry wells, and a detached garage. I'm just gonna go through a quick timeline of the documents you have in your folder through the existing conditions and proposed conditions. Um, so we were first scheduled for January um, 12 to come to our first hearing. We did receive some comments from Drew on the 11th. So um, in order to you know, review Drew's comments, uh, we requested a continuance of the 12th hearing. Um, then we did submit revised civil engineering plans um, that were dated January 27th. Um, to uh, try to address Drew's comments for the, pro for the project, as well as then the new plans you just um, received are plans that reflect the restoration and mitigation of that previous civil plan, um, the revision. So I just wanted to outline that. So, so what you receive there is not a change to any sort of footprint of the pool, patio, um, anything like that. It's the just the updated plantings of the surrounding areas and um, to, to just to match the current civil plans. So the site tonight is at 90 Papanesset uh, Island Road. Um, Papanesset Bay is to the east uh, with Papanesset Island Road to the west and two existing residential properties to the north and the south. An existing dwelling does um, is on the property now. There's also an existing uh, pier, ramp, and float uh, at the property. 
Um, parking is in to the south of the house um, along, and some parking along Pompanesset Island Road. The existing resource areas on the site are the land under the ocean and shellfish, uh, land containing shellfish, along with a salt marsh along the property edge, as well as a coastal bank, and then the buffers associated with uh, that salt marsh and coastal bank are shown on the plan, as well as the flood zone. There's a, a VE flood zone um, to the east of that blue flood zone line, and then an AE11 flood zone um, on the other side of, of the flood zone line. Um, the proposal is to uh, remove the existing dwelling and build the dwelling that is proposed. Uh, shown on the plan, the dwelling will be in approximate same footprint as the existing, as well as um, the decks and stairs from the decks. And then a new portion of the project is the, the patio and pool area that's in between a detached garage, as well as the driveway um, out to Pompanesson Island Road. Um, the existing project does cont already contain a four bedroom uh, septic system with an IA treatment, uh, nitrogen reducing treatment sy system at it. Uh, the proposal will have um, drainage, uh, dry wells, and drainage for the patio area, as well as a pool drain down um, area, and um, other items associated with the design are a area for dewatering if necessary. Um, we don't believe that for installation of pool, patio, there might be a small portion of a foundation somewhere that might need it, so we've um, applied details and the method, methodologies for dewatering if it's necessary. Um, and the difference in the plan you see in front of you that Drew has up in the previous plan was, and, and Drew's comments were, <coughs> on the southern side of the property, there was, um, a, an amount or significant amount of work in the naturally vegetated um, 50 to 100, primarily in the 50 to 100 foot buffer zone. Uh, there was even a small portion of work in the um, zero to 50 uh, buffer zone too, as well in the, in the naturally vegetated area. What we did is reduce the pool and patio area. The um, if you the the garage, the driveway, by about almost 70% out, out of, removed from that naturally vegetated area. There's still a small strip on that, and basically where, where you see those two symbols of the cars are, there's a very small strip still, um, but it's a significant reduction of um, any kind of work in the naturally vegetated area. And um, so ultimately, we also, that changed, reduced required mitigation from over 2,500 square feet down to about 2,000 square feet. And what we did not do, though, is reduce the proposed mitigation. All that um, green area, darker green area on this project, as well as the brown area, um, is mitigation. And then once we get into the Crawford Land Management Plan, you'll also see we're also restoring areas on site um, beyond the mitigation. So. We've also, this proposal has um, created a, the natural buffer strip in the zero to 50. Um, the existing conditions, about 48% of that natural buffer strip um, w was only remaining. So 52% uh, of it was disturbed by um, just historic lawn. Um, and work in that area. So we're all, we're all the way up to almost 80% of that natural buffer area restored. So we feel that this proposal tonight does uh, provide a net environmental benefit through, um, and I sat through the, the initial discussions tonight, I think three of the key things that came up through that was um, limiting fertilizer, uh, lawn is basically reduced just to that lighter green strip around the house for access around the house. You know, we. Um, mitigation plantings and buffer restorations are right up to that, um, but we do want 
the homeowner to you know, just at least be able to get around the house. Um, runoff, all the roof runoff will be contained. Um, the pool and patio area will have uh, runoff associated with it. And then we greatly increase the vegetated buffer um, for that plan. I'm gonna hand it over to Nick just to describe some of the, some of the Crawford land management plan. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Nick Crawford from Crawford Land Management. Um, so, as Mark said, if you look at the um, diagram up in the upper right-hand corner of the plan, um, the entire blue area is currently not naturally vegetated and kind of Cape Cod long. So that is, um, that greatly increases the uh, naturally vegetated buffer um, to both the coastal bank and the, the salt marsh. Um, in addition to that, the areas that are shown in the stipple um, will have invasive species management performed. Um, on site right now, it's predominantly Asiatic bittersweet and black locust. Um, there isn't a ton of it, but it would be great to be able to get it while it's still kind of in its early stages. Um, <clears throat> there's no, you know, the proposed work doesn't take there is no taking of any naturalized areas in the zero to 50. Um, and as Mark said, there's a, the red portions on the plan are the two small areas where um, we do uh, go past the existing um, edge of vegetation. Uh, in addition to that, the, the lighter blue or kind of purple area on that diagram um, is an area that will also be restored. Um, that's outside the 100 foot buffer. Um, so, you know, all those things will, all, all of those things will um, result in a healthier plant community and a graded vegetative buffer to the resource areas that we're trying to protect. Um, and just some uh, rough numbers. Um, I'll just hit the highlights. Um, there'll be an increase, uh, there'll be an additional 354 native woody shrubs added per the mitigation areas. Um, that doesn't include 430 square feet of um, native black huckleberry sod that will be also be installed. There's also 1,100 um, native perennials, grasses, and sedges that will go in these areas. Um, in addition to that, we are proposing 17 trees of um, both tupelo and serviceberry um, to replace the minor amount of tree removal required to perform the work. Um, then there's also an additional 69 native woody shrubs that are just part of the restoration area that um, are outside of the required mitigation. Um, so, you know, the vegetated areas on site are going to be increased, they're going to be enhanced. Um, and existing naturalized areas are gonna be supplementally planted um, to make them more robust. Um, and th and that's, that's about it. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. I have a question on the filing itself. I'm looking at page four of the notice of intent. And under mitigation measures, it says Town of Mashby Regulations, Chapter 172 of the Mashby Code, Regulation 12, adopted June 30th, 2005. We've updated that regulation, and I'm just curious, are we okay in meeting the guidelines that are set forth in the new reg? Yes. So that's just yeah. not an issue. <coughs> not an issue. Okay. My other concern is the velocity zone. And I'm looking at part of the pool and the patio and a pretty good piece of the proposed garage. I know it's on piles. Uh, the concrete pad for the mechanicals of the pool and they're all in the velocity zone, correct? Correct. How do we square that with regulation 25.5? I don't, I'm, I'm having a difficult time with that. Regulation 25.5 says, new structures including buildings, sheds, and garages, additions, and substantial improvements to existing structures supported on solid foundation 
or propose below the base flood elevation, that these are all counterintuitive to the uh, presumed significance and characteristics of land subject to coastal flow. So I'm a little uncomfortable with all of that development going into the velocity zone. The, like you said, the garage will be on piles and, and built uh, per building code for the velocity zone, as well as the, the deck. There's a portion of a deck that will be a freestanding deck built in accordance with those regulations. Um, your, I don't have regulation 25 in front of me, but did you say it, was prohibiting those things. Um, I'm just trying to. It's saying, as per section 12 of chapter 172, the burden of proof is upon the applicant for any work alterations described above to demonstrate that the said work or alterations will not have unacceptable, unacceptable significance or cumulative effects upon the critical characteristics and presumptions of significance, as for Part B of this regulation. When I see a lot of development of velocity zone, it's a red flag to me. So I'm just I'm asking, uh, make me feel a little bit more comfortable of putting this kind of development into a velocity zone. Well, the, there's portions of the existing house. There's a, a stairwell and part of the deck that, that are already in that. And, but those would not be to today's um, current codes for that work. Um, even the house itself, I believe it has a, a full basement that doesn't have, uh, you know, is not to today's um, code. Um, so the new house would uh, meet all those uh, building code requirements for development in, the, in that velocity zone. So for, for that reason, that improvement of both the house that's in both the VE and the AE um, being completely brought up to today's codes. Uh, you know, we do feel that, uh, and as well as all the other environmental benefits, um, you know, we do feel that this does meet uh, your requirement for not being more detrimental to the, per se, to the floodplain. And what about the, the patio and the, uh in-ground swimming pool and concrete pads. I mean, I, I get the house. I get the piece that it's a better house. But I'm a little concerned about um, absorb, absorption characteristics of a floodplain, especially in a velocity zone. I mean, that's the first place the water is going to come in. So again, I feel a little bit uncomfortable covering up that zone with solid infrastructure, pool, patio, concrete pads. I, um, well, there we have provided both um, all the roof drains as well as uh, there are patio drains and the existing driveway, which is um, over, you can, I could highlight it potentially on the plan, over 70% of that infrastructure already, um, you know, it's not, I think, the improvements of all the drainage um, as well as the uh, just the the mass of all the native new species versus bare ground that's there uh, would also you know that those changes would also offset um, any kind of increase of runoff from these areas since they are being managed by by the the drainage improvements. Okay. Uh, I'll turn it over to other commissioners. That May I have questions or comments? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I had the same questions you had about the flood zone with, um, because if you're looking at the elevation of the, looks like the patio is 4.80, if correct. Yes. And then I'm looking at the first floor dwelling at 14.67. So if the deck is at 14, elevation 14, I would assume, and the outer part that's in the flood uh, velocity zone, which is elevation 14, that you're going to get wave action coming in on that deck and wave action on that pool. I understand the garage is elevated, you know, and that's that's fine. But I'm concerned about the pool and the deck that you're going to have wave action. How will that, um, you know, wave action inundating that pool and that deck, for mm -hmm. causing you know damage and so forth? And then 
I know the rest of it's all flood zone, so you know, once you get past the wave action, it's just flooding. It's all water. Yeah, so that right. was just my concern about the, the pool. You know, because that's. How deep is the, the pool? Way <coughs> back. Um, it's, and just to clarify, the, the edge of the pool is at 6.5, so, but it'll, it'll be roughly four feet. Um, because it, you know, we, it, we don't want it in the groundwater and things like that. So the depth of the pool will be roughly four feet, um, and the pool is raised. The pool is raised a couple feet above that surrounding par uh, patio area, um, and you know there are a lot of pools sited in floodplains. And yes, it would very well at that elevation be potentially be inundated. Yes. Mm. So that's a, my concern is that it, is it a saltwater pool or is it a it, a it it is proposed to be a saltwater treatment pool. Okay, but then if you had a storm on that, all that water is going to mixed out. So does that go against where we're talking about having the uh, you know for the drain when you drain the pool into a drywall or pumped out? Is that a well, contradiction could, there? We could condition any kind of drainage of a pool to go into a truck and take an off-site rather than get into dry wells and mitigation and dealing with that, even though it, it's salt water, so it's not as bad as a freshwater pool, but it still has issues. I'm just concerned if you get a, a flood event with wave action, what is it going to do to the structures and the water in the pool? Where's that you know, water going to go? If we, if we put a condition to pump it into a truck, well, if you get a storm, that just right. Yeah. Other concerns or questions? Can I just follow up on on Steve's point? Um, we recently made that a condition for another uh, property. Um, when when the condition is to um, on a drainage uh, from the pool to truck it out, is there a time limit on that, or is that ad infinitum? that it goes onto the property. I believe it's a, it was an order in the order of conditions when the certificate of compliance is issued, you could have that as an ongoing. It would, it would be an in perpetuity yeah. condition, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, I, but I hear your point, Steve, that if it's a, one, of, one of our bad ones. Yeah. Uh, the other question, do you, what's the elevation of the pool equipment and mechanicals? The, the mechanicals would be at, at a minimum of the 6.5 where the um, that pool elevation is. So the, all the pool equipment is below the flood elevation. Correct. I think that goes against code. It could be there. There will be areas in the garage that it could it could be conditioned to be raised if if necessary. Yeah, I know the building code says all mechanical electrical equipment to be raised above the flood elevation or sealed. To meet it, so that would be another concern. Yeah. yeah. Well, there really isn't a location for that pad on this. It's, it's just an arrow that's pointing to an open area. Correct. I, I have something to add. Um, I just want to say, Nick, I love a plan like this and seeing all the plantings. It makes me very happy. Um, but I do have a, a specific question to the plantings. Where is the view from here? Are they going to come back asking for a view corridor or to like <coughs> prune things later on? So the idea behind the replanting plan was, I mean, we could de certainly show a corridor on the plan, but the idea behind the planting plan itself is that um, all the native species that are being replanted and way, where they're positioned on the site can reach full growth potential without impeding the view. Okay. Um, so right now the, the main view is kind of under the pitch pines to the left of the mown path and then over the mown path out to, uh, out to the coastal dune. Okay. Um, and then for the issue of the pool, I mean, It feels really hard to say yes to a pool in the velocity zone. Is there any way the pool can be bumped to where the fire pit area is so that it's moved out of the velocity zone? 
Yeah, the pool is considered a structure according to, for zoning setbacks, and the 40 foot, uh, basically if you connect the line from the southerly corner of the garage to the corner of the pool to the corner of the house, you know, there's a there's an arc there that's basically the 40 foot setback I see. to to the to the road. Fancy spa, <laughs> just like a jacuzzi where it's like half the size. Um, it's, I think that's where we're all kind of hung up is, is improving the pool across the Okay. Because all the plantings are great, but. Any other questions or concerns from commissioners? Charlie, are you all set? Have any questions? Yes, yeah, sir. He said all set. <clears throat> he said all set. He said, okay. Let me open it up first. I'll come back. Is there anyone in the audience that would have a question, concerns on this proposal? No, nope, hearing none. Drew? Some other things um, you would like to Well, uh, you all have my comments uh, in writing. And yep. As far as the velocity zone, um, <clears throat> I mean, looking at the building comments, uh, project needs to request a special permit, written finding and variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals. So he doesn't really touch on any issues with, uh, I'm not, not venturing to guess what his opinion is on the pool and the velocity zone, but I think that comes down to, um, you know, whether it's compliant with structures in the velocity zone. Um, I know that for the purposes of the commission trying to deliberate over whether or not to approve a pool that's partially within the velocity zone and looking at you know previously approved projects and in existing conditions all around uh, Pompanesset Island in particular, there's a lot of structures in the velocity zone. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're looking at a storm surge that's going to you know come in and impact uh, this pool patio area, I think you're looking at a lot more impact around, you know, the entire area for a storm surge of that size. So just to put it out there, uh, not saying it's good or bad, it's just something to take into consideration. Um, I like the uh, mitigation plan. I think that that adds a lot more flood storage capacity than the current situation and buffer zone, which is really diminished. Um, the plan helps to increase the buffer zone so I, uh, and make it much more robust. So I think that um, based on what they're proposing <coughs> uh, and the existing conditions uh, and enhancing the buffer zone, that it's a good trade-off. Um, I don't see any adverse impacts as a result of what's being proposed. That's not to say that you can't speculate about storm surges and the, and the you know, um, the robustness of that, but um, on the surface it looks like it's a good exchange. You've got a diminished buffer zone that's proposed to be uh, enhanced significantly in exchange for uh, expanded development, uh, mostly outside the 50 foot and completely outside any nat naturally vegetated areas within the 50 foot. Um, and if, uh, if the commission were to approve it, I have uh, recommendations of conditions of a signed contract with a qualified professional for three years of monitoring and maintenance of all mitigation plantings. Uh, all lawn areas must fall under Reg 31 standards and at no time shall pool water be emptied into any wetland resource area. Uh, pool water must be, if it's, it's full drawdown, must be done by a pump truck. <coughs> Board of Health uh, comments rodent, rodent inspection required with abatement if necessary. Septic design plans to be reviewed upon submission to the Board of Health. Floor plans to be reviewed upon submission to the building department. And I believe this is an IA system, Mark, is that correct? Correct. Okay. No other comments. Has a request been filed with the CBA for a permit? Um, nothing. We understand it's required. Nothing has been filed yet. So without that being filed, this is really incomplete. Yes. Mark, do you have any idea as to when the 
permit will be requested and filed so we could get a date from the ZBA for a hearing? Yeah. We could probably meet the next uh, filing deadline. Um, I do know discussions have started with, uh, I think we were gonna use attorney Chris Corrine for that filing. Um, so I believe we could, you're asking to, that the application be filed, not necessarily in a hearing approved. Just it has to be applied for okay. under our regs in Correct. order for the commission to uh, close the hearing. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we would request a continuance to the next available hearing and, and you know, do our best to get it filed. That gets yeah. taken care of. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, going back to your questions, does this uh, does this uh, project meet the requirements of the your questions from that section that you noted in the regulation? Or do we need more clarification on that? I, well, obviously we're going to continue this, I'm assuming, right. and I would like to take a closer look at it. I mean, I just, when I read Regulation 25 and I see this kind of development in a velocity zone, I have a lot of concerns. Okay, that's what I'm know, saying. If it's going to be continued, is this something that we just need more clarification on since it's going to be continued? You know, maybe if we come back in two weeks, we might even, well, I would assume we're going to see all of the, all of the um, equipment for the pool, you said you would move that under the garage so that that's out of the velocity zone. Yes, we will um, review pool equipment, review regulation 25 as well. Um, if there's changes, uh, we'll present them at the next meeting. Right. You might even come back with a smaller pool. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen that on other jobs. People yeah. have shrunk the size of pools. Bring it back and twist it around. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> But then I, I guess I would entertain a motion for a continuance. What would that date be? Uh, this would be February 23rd at 6.21 p.m. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, then, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move um, that we continue the issue for Brandon P. Giblin at 90 Pompanessa Island Road to February 23rd at 6.21 Thank you, Brian. Is there a second to that? Yeah, second. second. A couple of them. <clears throat> Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion before I call for a vote? Hearing none, Brian? Yes. Uh, Alex? Yes. Marjorie? Yes, sir. Aaron? Yes. Yes. And Charlie? Yes. I vote yes as well. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks for your time. Nice mitigation. That's beautiful. Yeah. I love it. That was that nice one there. <laughs> what did you say about April? No, no, I love the plant. It was a beautiful mitigation. Oh. That's good to hear. Sorry, I just want to pull something up here on me. Now calling the 606 hearing for Paul J. and Catherine M. Thurston, 25 Menemsha Road. This is for a proposed construction of an in-ground pool, hardscaping and landscaping, 
representative is Flaherty and Stefani Incorporated. This is continued from 12-8-22 and 1-12-23. And there's been a request to continue this to February 23rd. I've, there is a motion. I just that. want to comment. <clears throat> yes. This is the third continuous? This would be the fourth. Mike, this would get closer to the mic. Is this yeah. the third or fourth continuous? The fourth. This is the fourth, I right. believe. And yep. we typically continue to. three times? Yes. And then what's supposed to happen after the third? Your discretion if you want to um, deny the application as presented. But nobody, I mean, yeah, it's, it's your discretion. Have they given a reason for the continuance? They are trying to find someone to delineate, redelineate the wetlands because that's what they were informed as far as comments from me and um, comments from a uh, consultant as well, noting that the, uh, the last time the wetlands were delineated, it was several years ago, uh, and they should be redelineated. Yeah. Um, and I believe uh, from what I heard from the applicant is that um, he hasn't secured that service yet. He's trying to, okay. but uh, so that's really. So uh, they, ha they, they came before us with insufficient, and the initial application had insufficient wetlands delineation markers. So can we, can we stop continuing this? I, I don't want to just like deny it outright, but can we tell them to, they don't need to like repay for the filing fee, but can, they, can we just tell them, get back on our agenda once you have everything? Um. This is I'm not sure I follow. <laughs> can we so I don't I don't I don't want to deny this. Mm -hmm. But can we say okay we're done with this putting it on our agenda for the next meeting. If they're not if they don't even have anybody contracted, why are we talking about it, like spending time talking about it at every meeting? And like wasting can we just tell them come back and get on our agenda once you have all the info you need? I think the only, the only options that you would have would be to go on the information that's before you currently and render a decision on it um, or accept a continuance. Um, I mean, they, the only other option would be for them to withdraw, but there's no way to get them to, you know, state that at this current time. It's, it's already so before you. You could deny this based off of the lack of you information could. in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I would like to make a motion to deny this application for 25 Minamshire Road. And they can come back before us. All right, so it's to deny the continuance or to deny the application. I'm a little confused. Well, nobody made, a, nobody made a motion to continue. Right? Well, does anybody have the language? I'm sorry, are you, I don't want to interrupt you, but I think the language what Drew was uh, referring to is it. Once you get to the third one, there is language somewhere that tells us how we handle it from here on think out. But I believe so, that so I, I think the, he's run out of time. So the the protocol would be, and there is a request for a continuance before you. So there would need to be a motion to deny the continuance request, and then another motion made if you want to go on the information before you and render a decision. It would be two different motions. Oh, I see. So what would happen if we just denied the continuance? then you would act upon the information before you. Right. We can't just deny it and then have them resubmit once they have everything? Not without them requesting a withdrawal. Okay. Right, because I've opened the hearing, so right. we are in the hearing right now. I see. And if we deny the continuance, then we would go with the information that's before us. Okay. So I'll and make if a we motion. didn't have enough, then we could okay. deny the project. Okay, so then I'm making a motion to deny the continuance. I'll second that. Okay, so there's a motion before us to deny the continuance that was requested to February 23rd, and a second. So I'll open that up if anybody else wants to ask or comment on that discussion amongst the commissioners. Charlie, anything? No, nothing. All set. Okay, so there is no discussion, so I'll... Go to a vote. Brian? Yes. Alex? Yes. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. Charlie? Yes. I vote yes as well. So 
the motion carries and the continuance request has been denied. So we are now open for the proposal as presented. So as presented, I would like to make a motion to deny the application for 25 Menemsha Road. I'll second. So there's a motion made and seconded to deny the application. I'll open that up for discussion. And the first thing I would say is why? Are we going to be specific about yeah, because it was, the it was application itself? Given to us with insufficient information. It was outdated. The wetland wasn't properly delineated. And we don't know when they're going to come back in front of us. If they had had somebody, if they're, no, they're not even here talking to us. They're just wasting our time. Right. And this could be a contentious one anyway. Come back to us when you have all the information, and we'll hear it again. But until then, I feel like they're just, they're not taking us seriously, and that's right. not fair. And the delineation with the absence of, you know, the absence of wetland vegetation in a lot of the area, they're going to have to do soils. soils. Right. So maybe that's well, the hang up. I don't know what, what the delay is. but it's also, I mean, that would render it, in my opinion, incomplete, number one. And number two, to Alex's point, this is the application that I've received the most personal <coughs> negative information on from a butters. And a butters have standing. And if I think he's run out of time. I think if he comes back for a new hearing, has a new application, the abutters will have an opportunity to know then what it is. And, and Alex's points are well taken. This is a serious issue. He's on water. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to say, too, for the record, um, I can respect, you know, the abutters and everyone else, and I think that we need to stick to you know, what is in black and white and the fact that this is the fourth hearing, I think that needs to be the top of the priority as to why we're denying this request and make it very clear. This isn't personal, um, you know, because they should have the right to be here and to be heard. We should hear everyone's, um, you know, different inputs and views on this situation, which we have heard some, um, but not the applicants. So I just think we need to just put that on the record as well. Um, that's the reason why I personally, you know, would be denying this request. Okay. I would also just recommend that a new motion be made to, if you're going to deny it, to deny it without prejudice. I've never heard of that, but sure. It, it just means it's not personal. Right. It's, it's just you're denying it without prejudice. Is it Why implied? would any of it have yeah. prejudice? I don't approve well, things with prejudice. I'm sorry. I don't, it's, I mean, illegal. I don't. it's a legalistic sort of parlamentary courtesy, I guess. Yeah, it's right. courtesy so it's more than anything. Implied. Legally, I think that's the best thing to do yeah. to protect us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Alex is going. I'm not prejudiced against him. <laughs> well, I don't, well, I don't approve anything with prejudice. No, no, no. I know. Right. I know what you're saying, but, but sure. I think. We, uh, then, so. What, I think Drew makes a good point, though. Do an amendment. To come back to. Okay. So I'll make an amendment to the denial to make sure that it's understood that it's denied without prejudice. Yep. And I'll second that. Okay. Thank you. And that's okay. second. And what were the reasons, again, for a denial? The lack of, lack of information from the initial filing. They didn't have the okay. proper wetland delineations. Along with. What Brian said was the fourth hearing. Yeah. Those two, those two are the main reasons. Right. Right. Yeah. And well, they had, they could be in front of us and withdraw it until they have the sufficient. <laughs> but they don't have that. They're not giving us any information. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just wanted to. Great. I thought that was it. Just clarify. Okay. So, thank so you. those are our two main factors. Anything else before I call for a vote? Charlie, anything you'd like to add? I have nothing at this point. Okay. Thank you. All right then. Um, I'll take a roll call vote on that motion. Brian? Yes. Alex? Yes. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. Charlie? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Hopefully they can get their stuff together and come back and get back on the agenda down the road a bit. All right. <coughs> I'm now calling the 609 hearing for Rose M. and Sabino A. DeVito of 132 Uncle Percy's Road. This is a proposed replacement of a rotting back deck with natural stone flagging pavers. The representative is the homeowner, and this is a request 
for a determination of applicability. Good evening. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Rose DeVito. Um, my husband and I are here tonight to request your um, approval to replace our current wooden deck, which is original to the home that my dad built over 40 years ago. Um, it's, it's getting rotten. Um, it's, it's a little iffy. So um, <laughs> for safety purposes um, and for better usability, we would like to get rid of the, the wood and replace it with stone um, and increase the size of it a little bit. Forty years yeah. is a nice long time for your father's you. work. Thank you. Yes. Forty years. You did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's the deck on the lower level, the ground level deck, is not the two that are on the building. Correct. Itself. There's, yeah. there's no work being proposed for that. That's right. Okay. And do we have a the size yeah, of like the a new sketch? Plan. So the current deck is um, eleven by fourteen. Yes. I'm sorry about my That's okay. My I see drawing. it. 1 by 14. <laughs> yep. Um, and and to that, we're going to add an additional um, about 176 square feet. So it's only going to come out um, like four more feet from the current deck. Um, and to the right in front of the basement stairway, yep. that's, that's going to be filled in with stone pavers as well. So the, the proposed deck in the current measures out at 24 feet, 4 inches, correct? The, the proposed will be 24 feet. Yep. Okay. But currently it's, it's only um, 14. So it's going to come out an additional 10 feet. To line up with the basement stairway. Okay. Okay. I'll turn it over to commissioners for questions you might have. Yeah. Uh, you have a question? Okay, I have a few questions. Sure. Um, one is looking at the site plan. The site plan doesn't match up with the shape of the building. So. And then the other question is, it looks like according to the you know, GIS map, this is on, this looks like there's a wetland behind there, Drew? That, based yes. on this? Yeah. So is there a flood zone out there, or where's the <laughs> buffer zones? So this is in the, uh, probably the 90 to 100 foot setback from BBW associated with Dean's Pond, but it is within the 100 year floodplain entirely. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, because I, I couldn't tell from this old site plan. And yeah, yeah. So the other question I had is going back to the photographs of the rear of the house. It looks like there's an, um, you know, from the, the corner of the existing deck down, if that's a 2 by 8 or 2 by 10, it looks like there's, you know, 16, 18 inches at the corner deck. And then on the other deck, it looks like there's more. So it looks like that whole grade is sloping off. So if you're proposing a patio, you know, that goes over to that two-tiered deck with a grade drop of at least 24 inches, you're going to need a retainer wall there to hold in that patio. It's not all flat grade. Right. So, so the, you know, the two questions I have are, one, okay, yeah, is it in the buffer zone? We know it's in the flood zone. And then said, do we need retainer walls there? So now we're adding structure into the... Into the if it's necessary, I believe that the um, the mason was was going to build it up so that there wouldn't be any problem. Have you had a mason come in and do a? He came down a to plan. look at it. Yeah. Did yes. it did it include the retaining wall that he's trying? Um, I mean, he he said. 
that he, he would do. He, I guess it depends on when he's doing the work, how much it, it, it needs to be leveled off. Yeah. Uh, Where did you get your number, Steve, on the topography? Well, I'm just going, I'm just, just looking just at the photograph and saying, you know, to me, that, yeah, that looks like, all right, it's a two by eight joist on the deck. Yeah. And there's you know, like six or eight inches below that deck open. So there's 14, 15 inches. And then it looks like the grades drop down further on the yeah, other side. Yeah, it does. So my concerns are saying, all right, we have a, a flood zone. We have a buffer zone, which we don't know where it is. And the site plan doesn't match up the shape of the building. And you're going to need... Um, Retainer walls out there, so we're adding structure yeah. in the buffer zone. So to me, I, I, to, to me, this is, would be an NOI versus an RDA because there's all these unanswered questions. I understand the deck, you know, needs to be replaced or sure. things like that. So yeah. I think, I mean, it's going to be on the ground, right? Yes. So if the deck is being removed, you would step out and step down. There might need to be, yeah, a little bit of a retaining wall along that outer edge. Yeah, if you're just going to replace okay. the deck in the same footprint without expanding it, I would say that would probably fit the requirements of the, a, of the RDA, I should say, versus expanded and putting in retaining walls. That's, you know, that's my concern. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I hear you totally. The thing, I, I just had a patio done at my house with a retaining wall, and um, it didn't actually disturb anything really outside of that area when they were able to do it. They just, like, you know, pushed in the fill, and then they back were able to put the papers on top of it. So uh, I do think it could be an RDA. If no vegetation is being removed. No right. vegetation is going to be removed. Because it's just in that space. No trees, no bushes. Right. The, you can't even call it grass. Right. It's, <laughs> it's dirt, basically. Yeah. But we're adding structure into the buffer zones. We don't know where the buffer zones are from the well, edge of the BVW. They do, yeah, they use GIS, and I actually went out because I've been to the site a few times to measure. It's in the outer 90 to 100 foot buffer zone from the BVW. So the reason I suggested an RDA is because when you've got such a minor scope project that's outside the 50-foot setback, and this is, you can see from the images of the site, this is viewing, stepping in front of the deck area, looking out towards Dean's Pond, mm. fully vegetated. Their property doesn't go to the pond. It's intercepted by PBA property. So taking into consideration the minor scope of the project overall, mostly going over existing deck and then, and then existing lawn, it's setback from the wetlands being within the, the 90 to 100 foot setback. Uh, yes, it's within land subject to coastal storm flow, but it would seem just from, from my evaluation of the project that it's not adversely impacting anything uh, as far as the wetland resource areas, the BBW. Um, flood zone, there could be some, you know, uh, points made about the flood zone, but again, the lot, as far as the square footage of the lot, uh, it's already contains enough naturally vegetated areas to meet Reg 25 standards. So all those issues combined are why I recommend an RDA instead of a notice, because it's, it really is a very small minor scope project, um, and I didn't see any, any aspect of it that could be construed as having an adverse impact on any of those resources. Could you uh, slide that up a little bit so I can see the um, sky view of the property? So, it, yeah, there it is. Okay. And do we, do we have the um, flood zone classification? Is it it's the 100 year, not the velocity. Okay. Uh, the AE. AE. Yeah. Yes. 13, 14? Or 11? I think it was 11. It's 11. 11. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else from the commission? Anyone that's in the audience that would like to comment or question? Any closing comments, Drew? Uh, no. No other comments. Okay. 
All right, then I would entertain a motion on the proposal. I'll make a motion for a negative determination for 132 Uncle Percy's Road. Thank you, Alex. Yep. Second to that motion? Second. I'll second it. I think Brian can have it. March has. <laughs> right. March can have Ladies it. Ladies' choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't want to be in your debt. You take it. <laughs> I'll accept Marjorie for the minutes. Okay. Yeah. How <laughs> gallant. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, both of you. Um, any discussion on the motion that we have for a negative determination? Hearing none, I will take a roll call vote. Brian? Yes. Alex? Yes. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Uh, yes. Charlie? Yes. I vote yes as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Nicely done, even though you're drawing, you know, it's a little. <laughs> Stay off that rotting deck. <laughs> yeah, we're, In the meantime. We're going to have art thing. <laughs> For um, you call the next hearing, Drew, what would be the time for that continuance for this one? Oh, uh, for which one? The next one. Oh. So this is this would be for? 621. 621, you said? 621 was the last, the last one. 612 is the next one. No, I think it's for 223 at 624 p.m. Right, because they're three minutes apiece. Uh, can you um, just which one are we talking about? <laughs> so before he calls the next hearing, I yeah. said I see the notes. It's supposed to be continued. So I'm asking what the time would be. You're talking about 21 Metacomet? Yes. Okay. The yes. time is 6 p.m. Okay. on March 9th. Oh. Okay. okay. On March 9th. Yes. Okay. Okay. March 9th. Okay, so let me um, open up the hearing. Um, this is 612 hearing for James Whitney, NJCJ, LLC, 21 Metacomet Road. Proposed reconfiguration of a previously approved float and the installation of a pier section. Representative is Falmouth Engineering. This is continued from 126.23. Public hearing notice was not published in the Mashpee Enterprise. And the request is to be continued to March 9th. Correct. At 6, 6 p.m. Correct. Mm -hmm. I'll entertain a motion for that. Make a motion that we continue the issue for James Whitney at 21 Metacomet Road to March 9th at 6 p.m. Thank you, Brian. Second. Thank you, Alex. Any discussion on the motion for continuance? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Brian? Yes. Alex? Yes. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. Charlie? Yes. I vote yes as well. So that will continue that to March 9th. OK. Now calling the 615 hearing for Thomas J. Gard and Michelle Gard, trustees, 409 Monomaskoy Road. This is a proposed raise existing shed, construct and maintain a new <coughs> detached garage with a second floor loft, install a new storage shed, and expand the stone driveway. The representative is Cape and Islands Engineering, and this is a notice of intent. Good evening. Good evening. For the record, Raul Lizardi from Cape and Islands Engineering, representing the applicant and property owners, who, for introductions, um, he is here in the audience, along with his attorney, um, Tom Gard. Um, the project before you, as just mentioned, it's a notice of intent um, for a proposed um, redevelopment of the site. The wetland resources um, on or within 100 feet of this property are Land under the ocean, which is Little River. There is land containing shellfish, which is the same body of water. Um, there's a salt marsh um, along the shores of the river. And there's a little bit of a portion of a coastal bank just because of the definition of the slopes of the land. 
The property has been developed as a single family dwelling since the 1950s. Um, um, and a few years ago, I believe about a decade or, or a decade and a half ago, this property received a notice of, um, or an order of conditions for an addition, a three bedroom addition in front of the existing dwelling that's um, right now on the property. That addition did not take place. Um, that um, notice of intent has since, or order of conditions has since expired. Um, what did take place from that approval back in, in that order was the, the septic system. The septic system was installed, was installed for those approval. It is an IA um, innovative nitrogen reducing septic system. It's located as far as possible from the wetlands, um, um, just coming up to driveway to the left, entering the site off of Monomosco Road. What the applicant wants to do is first remove the shed from its current location. They're gonna try to relocate it instead of just removing it and um, destroying it. Uh, so they're gonna try to just lift it and reposition it um, closer to the front of the property. And in the area where portion of the shed is and a lot of the driveway is, they wanna build um, a garage. Um, so the garage um, is completely in the flood zone. That's another resource that I did not mention earlier, but the entire property is within land subject to coastal storm um, flowage. Um, so in that particular area that is currently used for parking as just gravel parking, um, they wanna build this garage. Um, above the garage, there's gonna be living space. Um, the whole project does not increase number of bedrooms, so there is no increase on septic flow. So the septic system does not have to be altered from what is currently um, on the site. Um, other improvements that are proposed here is there's um, a little portion of additional porous um, driveway, which is gonna be the same crushed stone that's on the property, just to allow the entry and exit of the, into the garage. Um, the garage and the new shed location is completely outside of the 50 and 100 foot buffer zones to the coastal bank or the salt marsh, but it's completely within the flood zone. Um, for those who went to the site and entered the driveway, um, there is that big first um, oak tree um, at the bend of the driveway. The oak tree, it's, it's a good size, um, but at about a height of 15 to 20 feet, it splits into two main trunks. One of the trunks are really completely dead, and the other trunk is starting to die from the top down. So we're proposing to remove this tree before it becomes um, a hazard. Um, there's no other proposed um, trees removal. There is some limbing um, that we are proposing to one of the trees um, that's near the septic tanks and where we're proposing the turnaround coming out of the driveway. Um, but the tree is proposed to remain. Just we have to um, clear the lower limbs so that the cars can maneuver around. Um, so that's the project that we have for this um, project. And just to be upfront, um, the following two projects are the same applicants. So I'll take any, answer, any questions, um, try to answer them if I can. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. On, your, on the um, finished uh, space above the <coughs> proposed freestanding garage, is there a bath? There is gonna be baths, yes. So you'll be adding, how many baths are in the existing dwelling? I don't have that number. There's two bathrooms in the existing dwelling. Two, two full? Yes, ma'am. Two full. So, and that doesn't affect at all the septic. Right. Um, so the septic flow is based on occupancy. Right. So Title V um, goes about two person per bedroom, which is in today's way of livings is too much. Um, but yeah, so it's two persons per dwelling. So uh, two persons per bedroom. Um, so you can have a house with three bedrooms and 10 bathrooms. The amount of faucets or toilets does not change the daily flow for the septic. It's based on the use by people. So the fact that you're calling it a family <laughs> room instead of a bedroom is, right. is what you're going on. Right, except that um, Title V also has ways of defining bedrooms that are not necessarily um, spaces that have a bed. Yeah. It's enclosures, so you could have a den and it meets the definition of a bedroom, so that will be a bedroom. 
for the purpose of septic designs, yes. So the current <clears throat> septic design is what? Um, this one is a five bedroom system and it's not gonna change. We're keeping it as a five bedroom system. And what is, what's the GPD on that row? I'm sorry? What, what's the gallons per day on that system? 550. 550. Yes. And how old is this system? Um, it is a Title V system with an AI system. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know it's after 2000. I just can't remember after what. 2000. Yeah. Um, I, I have the plans from when it was designed. I don't know when it was installed because it had to do when the project was proposing a new dwelling in front of it. Mm -hmm. Part of the project was done. The dwelling was never built. The system was built and it was signed off. Um, but it, it was, I believe it was post 2000. Okay. All right. The system has been maintained as required for AI systems. There have to be um, routine maintenance of this type of septic systems and the homeowner has been doing so. Has this project been filed for uh, in front of ZBA yet? It's been filed, yes. Been filed. Okay. Other questions from the commissioners? Charlie, any questions? Oh. He's all set. Okay, I'll open it up to members that are present here. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, Drew? you have anything else you want to add? <coughs> Nothing um, above and beyond the comments that I provided. Um, just to review some photos of the site. This is the general area of the proposed detached garage, upper left image. That's so the existing see, shed? That's the existing shed, correct? Yeah. That's the one that's going to be proposed to be moved to this area. Uh-huh. So going back to satellite image, basically back in here is yep. where the shed is being proposed to be relocated. This large tree right here, this is the one they Raul pointed out, and I'll go back to the images, um, that represents a hazard, and I agree, it's this one right here. Um, mm -hmm. So you've got portions of the, the trunk uh, that are, portions of the tree that are outright dead, and because of its size um, at the entrance and proximity to the driveway, I completely understand why it represents a hazard. Um, as it currently exists. So um, this again, the area, this is one of the structural corners for the detached garage. So the garage is going in with the exception of some minor pruning of some of a nearby cedar uh, to accommodate some of the driveway expansion. There's no alteration of any naturally vegetated areas on the lot. So it meets the standards uh, for land subject to coastal storm flow under Reg 25. Um, no other comments. Thank you. Sure. I'll open it up to the commissioners to I'll entertain a motion, if there is one. Shall I move? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to <clears throat> make a motion uh, for Thomas Gard, Michelle Gard, at 409, Monomaskoy. Um, pending, is, did you want me to put in something there, Steve, about the ZBA, or are we assuming that they've, they've they, already They fired? have provided proof of application to the ZBA. Yeah. They're all set. They're all set. Uh, so uh, I recommend close an issue. I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion we have on the table for closing issue? You good, Alex? Yes. No discussion? I'll call for a vote. Brian? Yes. Alex? Yes. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. Charlie? Yes. I vote yes as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. There you go.
I'm now calling the 618 hearing, Thomas J. Gard, M.T. Gard, L.C. of 411 Monomiskoy Road, proposed raise of existing dwelling with all appurtenances, construct and maintain a new dwelling with garage under, detached garage slash workshop with a second floor loft, storage shed, proposed mitigation plantings, and new nitrogen reducing Title V septic system. Representative is Cape and Islands Engineering, and this is a notice of intent. Good evening, Raul Lizardi from Cape and Islands Engineering, representing the applicant, who again is in the audience with us tonight. Um, yes, so this project, um, the applicant just purchased the, pro the property last year. It went up for sale, and he was concerned that somebody else could do something else with the property, so decided to purchase the property and prevent someone else doing something on the site. Now, the existing site, similar to the project just presented, it's an existing dwelling that was built in the 50s, um, but it is very small, and it's in rather disrepair. So any kind of improvement to that particular structure would render a 50% increase in value of the structure, so we will definitely require complete new reconstruction. Because it is in the flood zone, um, we have to meet flood zone requirements for this particular project. So the house is almost, the existing house is almost entirely in the um, 50 to 100 buffer zone to, to the salt marsh that I mentioned earlier. Um, but we also have everything on the property within land subject to coastal stone flowage. So we have to raise the structure and lift it so that the finished floor, the living spaces, have to be one foot above the flood zone elevation. So that's what we're proposing to do here. Raise the existing structure, raise the existing shed, build a new house that meets flood zone requirement constructions. The first floor is up in elevation um, 14 as shown on the plan. The bottom of this um, house is gonna be open. Um, it's gonna be a slab on grade at elevation six, which is roughly the elevations of the grade of the ground. On the back of the house, where is the existing septic tanks, there's two septic tanks on the back of the house. We're proposing to remove those two tanks. The septic system that's serving this existing house is similar to the other project in the front um, towards Monomoskoy, except that this system is not a, an AI system. This is just a Title V septic system. There's two tanks in the back of the house, leaching field out by Monomoskoy. What we propose to do with the new house and the new garage is to have a new Title V system, septic system with nitrogen removal enhancement. So we're proposing a fast tank. Um, we have to use a pump chamber after the tank just because of grades and separation to groundwater. So we're pumping to the, practically the same location of the existing leaching field, except that we're raising the leaching field and raising the grades for the new driveway. Um, the existing grades um, are coming up by about a foot just to get the separation to groundwater. On the back of the proposed house, we are proposing a, a 16 foot deep deck. Now that this house is gonna be roughly nine feet above the existing ground, um, we cannot just walk out of the house on the back of the house and have your yard like currently it does. Right now it's just a step out and you're in your yard. Right now on the back of the house at nine feet above the ground, what we're proposing to do is a 16 foot deck um, below the deck, it's just gonna stay open. Um, so it's not gonna be completely impervious since rainwater can filter through the slacks of the decking and get infiltration underneath it. But it is an, in an increase in the area between the 50 to 100 foot buffer zone to the wetlands. So we're proposing a mitigation at a ratio of one to one. In that area, there's also one tree that is also kind of half dead and we're proposing to remove that one tree. Um, similarly to the project before, we have a proposed shed. This shed location is kind of mirroring the shed that um, we presented earlier. <coughs> he owns the two properties, so he's gonna have sort of two sheds kind of side to side on the two different properties. Um, the vegetation that's being affected with these sheds is arborvitae, which is non-native and it's ornamental. Um, and that's the project that we're presenting before you. Um, we are proposing um, 
instead of the typical dry wells that we propose, we're proposing trenches um, just to cover more area with, with an elongated kind of leaching system rather than the circular deep systems. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I also, this was also submitted to ZBA because it does need relief from CBA. Thank you. Um, on the, the proposed garage slab, you have that trench drain. It's 32 feet long, two feet wide, two and a half inches high. And I noticed somewhere on the plan, it shows an overflow. Pretty sure it was on here. Where the downspouts come down and I don't see it. So yes, the, there's- Maybe it was on the previous. There's a detail up here. I believe that's the overflow splash. Yes, that's, that's right. So yes, that's, that's a typical detail. What we don't want, um, so we've lately seen big storms, a lot of rain come down. Um, we designed drainage systems to handle a typical 25 year storm. That's a prescribed kind of volume. There's no doubt that there are storms that are bigger than 50, bigger than 100, bigger than 200. If the volume coming down the downspouts saturates this leaching system, right. We wanted to be able to come back through the downspout, but not make it all the way to your roof. So there is an, a splash overflow. So if, if water does make it back up the, the pipe, it goes to surface. But the initial runoff from that volume that we can handle does make it to the leaching facility. Right. So on that garage, <clears throat> is there a drain on each corner that's coming down with that overflow? Uh, so what we're proposing is the, the leaching trench on the one side and we'll collect everything to the one side. Um, the downspouts that are coming on the front of the garage will be directed to the one end and the downspouts on the back of the garage will be directed to the opposite end. So in the case of an overflow, what's to prevent that water from, because that's awful close to the property line, what's to prevent the water from going on to the neighbor's property? So the grading on this site um, from the back of the garage, we have it that is grading towards, like it's doing now, it's grading towards Little um, River. From the front, we have the front of the garage at elevation seven, and we have kind of the, the middle line, property line that he owns, that will be the low point from the garage over the driveway that we're proposing, and then that middle, low, middle line where the arbovitis is, that ends up being the low area. So the garage, we have a proposed entering at elevation seven. If you look right. north of that, we have a 6.5 and keep looking north, we have an elevation contour of elevation six around the edge of the arborvitaes. It's fairly flat, the property. I mean, we're talking seven, six, but in a span of about 40 feet, that is, that, that's gonna seem fairly flat. The driveways, just to, to add more, is the recommended porous crusher, crush, crush shells or crushed stones, so it's not gonna be completely um, shedding water um, all the time. True, do you have photos of the site? I will also add, um, like you see in the pictures, there's really no naturally vegetated buffer. The site has been maintained for years. There's a little bit of uh, buffer close to the salt marsh um, where we're kind of increasing that, that little bit of buffer that we have there. Let's see if I can get a picture of that. Yeah, I don't really have a picture of the salt marsh area. But... And the back area is fairly f flat. <laughs> um, yeah. And there's... <clears throat> I think what's most interesting about the backyard when I was out there the other day is that it, it did you see there's like a rack line in the yard from where the yes. most recent tide had to like come Yeah, um, we're gonna, 
eventually in a couple of weeks see a project where in December we had a big storm and the water level was extremely high. And yes, you're gonna see that for, for many projects that you go see, but it is not the typical rack line that you will see. But around past Christmas, we had a, a really big storm and yeah, the ocean was pretty high. Can I ask a question on your on the uh, proposed home and the uh, garage? How many bedrooms? Five. Five. Uh, all together between the two structures? Yes. Yeah. And that fast system has been in for how long? Or is it? No, this is Oh, new. this is not in. This is completely new. new. This system is completely new. And it handles? It's designed for five. For five? Um, I'm looking at the mitigation, and it's 479 square feet, and you're proposing 480. Right. The required, and based on the calculation, is 479. We're proposing 480. Are requirements higher than that now through with the new mitigation regulation? This is in the buffer, right? The, the different calculations are if you're in, increasing in the 0 to 50, there is an incremental um, mitigation requirement. In the yeah. 50 to 100, the calculation is 1 to 1. And that's where we are. Okay. It's not 2 to 1, Drew. What's that? It's not 2 to 1. Is, is what? The mitigation requirement? It's a one it's, to one ratio? It's then? one to one in the 50 to 100 foot setback. And the zero to 50, it's incrementally increasing the closer you get to the zero foot setback, starting at 50. I, okay. I yeah. thought it was more. I will say the cherry tree that is marked as half dead is definitely old and dropping some limbs, but it is beautiful. And it is sad to see that one go for a deck. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard when it, there's one tree on a property or maybe two on that side. But I would also say this plan doesn't show, and this will come up more with the next hearing, so it's like a little hard, but it doesn't show the cedar tree that's in the buffer um, next to where the ramp is for the dock. So the existing pier, there is a cedar tree there that is not shown on this plan. Um, and I mean, it kind of shows the squigglies for the buffer that's there, but there is a cedar tree in there that's not called out. I know there's a there's a good sized cedar um, about 20 feet north um, from this pier um, that we're not proposing to touch. There is a, a smaller um, shrub. I don't bay think berry. it was a cedar. It's a bit, there's a bayberry bay there too. Um, but yeah, for the next application, um, we can relocate or replace um, that bayberry. And we'll get to that point. Yeah, that's coming. Um, so we, where the driveway is um, drawn out and we have all of the, uh, the Leachfield area, I seem to remember some fairly, there's a couple of large oak trees that were in that area. Am I mistaken on that? I know where that cap pipe was. And if you come directly across where those green um, filtration chambers are. Aren't there a couple of good-sized oak trees right in there? So on the left side of the driveway, um, I don't think on the left side of the driveway because, because the existing septic system is there. Um, so the proposed septic system is fairly in the same vicinity as the existing. 
and it's kind of following the existing driveway. There are a few two inch, um, if I see correctly, there are some, I believe some pitch pines. There is a 10 inch, I believe it's oak, um, to the left of the septic system. There's a 14 inch to the right. Um, I see there's two 14 inch trees to the right of the driveway coming into the site. No, there was a stake for the edge of the leach field, and it was, it couldn't have been more than a foot or two away from one of those good-sized oak trees when I was on the site. And I thought, how are you going to get this in here without disturbing the root structure of this tree? Dan, you were there that day as well. Yeah. You know the ones I'm talking about, those two good-sized oaks? That yeah, it's, uh, there's one there on the right on the top picture. There's an oak right there. Then there was one in front, yeah. more more in front of it, about 30, 20 yards up or so, uh, with the stake you were talking about. All right. So are those going or staying? So yeah, if, if I kind of see a 12-inch deciduous tree on the plan where I have a no surface vent. Um, if we go to the plan and you see where I have the note surface vent, just to the left of the surface vent, right there, there's a 12 inch. Maybe that's the one um, you're referring to. Yeah, that at two feet from the field, that will have to go. So that's coming out yeah. as well. Yeah, both at that point. Trees, both of those hardwoods are going. There were two good sized ones from my memory that when I was on that site a little while ago. The other one that I see of a good size is a 10 inch, but it's almost at the property line next to the fence. So that one does not get affected with this work. Uh, I thought they were pretty much in line. Uh, I didn't take a picture the day I was out there, but Dan, you were there that day. Are those, weren't those two oaks pretty much in line? Yeah, they were pretty, pretty, pretty much in line. A couple of pinch pines that were you know, on either side. But I don't see them on the plan. Yeah. So I was just curious, you know, they, they stay in, they're going. I know they're there. I saw them on the site, but I don't see anything on the plan. Yeah, physically, if there's a tree two feet of a leaching field like this one, it is going to go. It, we have to remove it before we actually begin excavation. So I, I can tell you that that, that 12 inch definitely comes out. Um, I don't see the other larger tree that was mentioned, so I. It, at the moment, I can't comment on that one. So given the fact that those will go, what kind of mitigation are you proposing in lieu of that coming out? If the commission so chooses, we can um, agree to a condition for cedars or tupelos. Um, I don't know if a, probably Drew would probably guide us better. Maybe a replacement um, with consultation with staff. Um, if it's a deciduous and you want to see a deciduous come back, um, I'm thinking it's probably going to be either a maple or a tupelo. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr. Chairman, in in relation to that, this Drew's comments to you about meeting Regulation 25 for the vegetation on the front of the property that will disappear also too, right? So that's kind of tied into what you're saying. Yeah. So I, had in my uh, in my notes, Raul, <clears throat> I noted in the narrative that you pointed out the only area on the lot uh, that's naturally vegetated is is the fringe vegetation and then the salt marsh. But in the beginning of the property, and you can even see it, you know, from the GIS image, you've got this area here that's also naturally vegetated. Granted, there's not much understory. The way that I consider an area to be naturally vegetated is if it's dominated by native vegetation and not ornamentals. So whether it's lacking understory or not, um, I do consider that to be a naturally vegetated state. And there are you know, scattered trees. You can see them in the imagery here. You've got this area that I would consider to be, in its current state, naturally vegetated, and therefore should count towards that, you know, if these trees are going to be impacted from the leach field, um, than that, you get into, under Regulation 25, uh, an equal amount of square footage of mitigation for any sort of 
square footage of alteration into naturally vegetated areas. And I just saw that based on the narrative, this area wasn't counted he wasn't. or considered as naturally vegetated. But I, in my opinion, I consider it to be. It's not landscaped. It might have been altered a little bit with understory, but it's still a native vegetated area. Uh, maybe altered, but still naturally vegetated. It's not a landscape feature. It's not like garden beds or landscaping or hardscaping. It's naturally vegetated. So I just noticed that as an area, if it's going to be altered by the leach field, that should be taken into consideration as far as mitigation is concerned. So I don't do know. It seems unclear as far as how much of that vegetation is actually coming out as a result of the leach field because you just went over a couple of trees that were, look like they're going to stay on the plan and now you're saying they're going. So I think that affects the mitigation that you're offering up that so should be increased. This area on the front, the reason I did not calculate them as natural vegetated is because the area has been mowed. Right. Um, there are stand, standing trees, but the area has been maintained, mowed down. Um, so that's why when we call naturally vegetated buffer strips, it's areas that are natural, native species that are unmanaged. So that's why I did not count this front yard because of that. Now, I'm not quite sure if I'm looking at the picture correctly, but are we looking from Monomosco towards the house? Yes. So this is the left side of the driveway. Correct. Yeah. So that amount of vegetation, it's growing on top of the septic system that's there today. It is, I would never consider that portion naturally vegetated buffer street because that area has the septic system underneath it. Well, let me just, just to clarify it. Oh, wait. Sorry, Hold just on. to clarify it, I mean, Reg 25 uses the term naturally vegetated, not naturally vegetated buffer strip, but just naturally vegetated area. And granted, maybe that needs to be defined moving forward, but the way I see it is if you've got native growth and it's not an ornamental landscape bed, even if it's mowed, it's still naturally vegetated. It's dominated by native species. That's my interpretation of a naturally vegetated area. And granted, it's just not spelled out like that in the reg, but when you've got a domination of, of native species in an area that's not clearly landscaped, uh, yes, it's mowed, but still, it's not altered to the point where I would consider it to be non-native or, or a landscape feature. So that's my, my, my opinion of it. And maybe it needs to be defined under the regs, what is a naturally vegetated area. But it's not, it doesn't, Reg 25 doesn't use the term buffer strip, it just says natural vegetation. So yeah, on the, on the plan, we do show those um, two inch size trees. Yep. Um, we have that the septic system is gonna take one, two, the driveway turnaround takes another four. Um, and the proposed garage takes another one. Right. So there's seven plus the oak. So we're talking about eight trees that at least I can count mm -hmm. from what we're talking about from that picture. If we right. consider that area naturally vegetated, um, I wouldn't consider it as that square footage like I would typically calculate a naturally vegetated buffer. But in this case, as trees, as one tree. Um, so if the commission so chooses, we can propose or we can agree to a condition of A, replacement trees native trees. Mm -hmm. um, the location, um, I think it, it has to be like coordinated. I, I can see some areas now that we're moving the septic system completely underneath the driveway towards the front. There is some area for, that will be available for more mitigation uh, on tree, tree wise. Um, so the positioning of eight trees, we can just kind of work something with Drew for doing construction, but we can agree to replacement of a native species. Alex, you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, the trees next to the deck also, I mean, when you're out there looking at where the, the stake is, it's so close to those trees that they're gonna have to be like very uplimbed. I mean, it's a, it's also a raised deck. So you're looking at, yeah, so on the right side picture, the stake is under 
you can see it's like under the limbs and if that's going to be then raised up like that tree those four trees so yeah we would we would have to banish the limbs of those trees with pruning but not necessarily cut the trees because we if you picture the house that's there right now what we're doing is with that same footprint we're going up um, and then the deck comes forward the deck being like one step down from the house mm. um, so in that particular case what we're talking about is um, pruning those limbs not necessarily cutting the tree once you get on the ground level you can act you can walk around the house that's going to be elevated yeah, but right but the whole looking at that from this side, the whole left side of those trees is going to have to be limbed. They're going to be very one side heavy. I think Alex, I can take it a step further with if the corner of that existing house matches up with the corner of the uh, proposed house with an overdig for a foundation, you're going to be out at least four feet with soil. So those trees are going to be gone. Those trees won't, will not survive construction. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not. Because it looks like it's only within five or six feet from the corner of the house. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're gonna have a four foot, at least a four foot overdig for the foundation. Well, based on the stakes, I didn't think they would survive the pruning because basically you would have you're like shearing the whole, them up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so they, yeah. you wouldn't even get to that point; they'd be gone. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Just uh, um, in the interest of time. Um, if the board would be comfortable or the applicant would be comfortable um, with a continuance or um, requiring that be a condition um, for revised and updated mitigation plan to be submitted. I think also with the lawn too, my concern would be, um, you know, the last precedent that we set um, with that much lawn also making sure that the fertilizer is also included. No fertilizer as a condition. Um, I would rather have like the fertilizer just be a condition, so mm -hmm. no fertilizer, just be condition. Um, but no, um, I just talked to my client and he's willing to replace those four trees one to one within the same vicinity, just moving it um, further south. Um, so I wouldn't want to continue this if the matter is replacement trees. So if we replace 12 trees for 12 trees, um, those in the back, we can reposition them so that they're safely away from the new house. And I believe that could be dealt through a condition rather than having to come back um, and extend the, the hearing. Yeah, that's reasonable. I mean, I would leave it to the board's discretion like we've done before. If Drew's fine with the mitigation plan, I would be fine with it. Yeah. It's an easy enough That's thing to work out with the applicant, okay. in my opinion. To have a have them submit a mitigation plan that yeah. that you can that we can work with them to implement. Work with yeah. them, verify. Yep. Okay. Yeah, because that would address all your concerns on the front of the property along with on the water side of the property. Too, yeah. Okay. Yep. And you're saying that these trees that you're going to replace are south? <clears throat> so you're coming over towards the neighbor's property line. Those trees. So yeah, those those four right there that we have on the pictures, those are the ones that are close to the house and the close to the new deck. Right. So those are the ones that we're proposing to move kind of south west, yeah. um, just to give proper distance from the new deck. So whatever. Well, this ones this ones will not be relocated. This one will be removed. We'll replace them. Right. So the ones that are coming up will be a, a good safe, safe distance from the construction. Yeah. <coughs> I have just a, a curiosity question. The galvanized pipes that are capped, there's one on this parcel. I think there was one over on the other parcel as well. What are those? <laughs> um. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I have I, it on the plan. One of my thoughts was, is there a tank or something underground? That, I, think the owner I don't know. What, it, what is the galvanized pipe with the cap? It is a cap pipe. The owner knows. The owner knows. The owner knows. The owner knows. Yeah. I, if I may. I, yes. The, I'm just curious. They were um, 
shallow wells at some point for the for the previous uh, owners. In the, um, I think at some point there was no water to the property, so that's that one of those wells or two of those wells. They 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 actually left. You, they would hand pump uh, water, but at some point the the, the water quality is was and, and and of course they got water to the property, so they're right. they're essentially they just there because they were there. We'll, right. we'll address those, you know, but they they won't be used for anything at this point. They'll be they'll be removed. They'll be removed. And yeah. Was there one on 409 as well? No. Because <coughs> yeah. I saw a second one. <coughs> they were, you could see it on there's the two of them? Maybe one down behind the house? I think there's, um, there's a septic vent. There's one there, and there's, I think there's three on 411. Uh, there's one by the street, one, there's one by the street, one by the shed, and one in that picture that you just saw. I think there's three. Okay. And they should just hand pump it out, and they, but they haven't done that for, you know, I don't really know. I don't. I didn't know the folks well, but he left the pump thing. And I said, "You can mount this." Okay. Yeah. Um, a question for Drew, I guess. Um, if we do move forward with the conditions, um, with the revised mitigation plan, would you also um, recommend a condition for monitoring maintenance of that? Or yes. Okay. Yes. How many yeah. years? Uh, I would say a two-year monitoring and maintenance okay. agreement. Recommend a two-year. Any last uh, questions from the commission before I call for a motion? Okay. I'll entertain a motion if there is one. Mr. Chairman. I move that we close an issue um, for Thomas J. Gord at 411 Monomasquoy Road with the condition of a revised mitigation plan to be submitted and approved by the conservation agent, as well as the condition of no f fertilizer um, and a two-year monitoring and maintenance of the mitigation. Thank you, Brian. Is there a second to that? I'll second it. <laughs> People are quick. I think it was Alex who got it in first. Alex. Alex got it first? No, no, hang on. I said with the lawn, no? Did I say you with the lawn? just added with the lawn, real quick. With the lawn? Yeah. Okay. He, meant, he meant fertilizer on the lawn. Yeah. Not just in general. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Do that to meet that? Regulation 31 standards? Yes. Okay. And Alex has the second for the minutes, correct? Yes. Okay. Any discussion on the motion we have on the table? All set, Charlie? Yes. Okay. All right, I'll do a roll call vote. Brian? Yes. Alex? Yes. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. And Charlie? Yes. I vote yes as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Now calling the 621 hearing for Thomas J. Guard, MT Guard LC, 411 Monomasquoy Road. This is for a proposed removal of an existing pier and replace with new pier, stairs, ramp, and float. Representative is Cape and Islands Engineering, and this is a notice of intent. Good evening, Raul Lissardi from Cape and Islands Engineering, representing the applicant, um, Tom Gard, who's here in the audience with his attorney. Um, the project is a peer replacement project, but also an improvement. Um, the wetland resources are land under the ocean, which is Little River, land containing shellfish, the same body of water, um, salt marsh, um, and then on the abutting property to the north, um, a bit of a coastal bank. So the property has a uh, existing pier. It has an interim <coughs> license. Um, hopefully those who went to the site to take a look around did not attempt to walk on this pier. Um, it is not safe, um, to say the least. Not just that, um, the terminus point of this pier is a large platform, but there's barely a foot of water at that position. So. Um, 
when you bolt onto this pier, you're dragging your boat through muck during low tides. So what we're proposing to do is remove this existing structure completely and propose a new structure. So the beginning of the pier um, starts at elevation roughly a little higher than elevation two, comes up three, four steps onto the fixed platform boardwalk to reach a point um, approximately seven feet, 70 feet from the beginning, at which point the fixed pier ends. Then we have a ramp, and that ramp ends on a 200 square foot new float. The new float is gonna be supported or held in place with four um, piles, um, internal mounted piles. The proposed pier, the fixed pier, is gonna be supported by 10 piles. Um, so the intent for this project is to reach water depths that are adequate for boating. So we're proposing to reach water depths of two plus feet. Um, at the far end of the pier, we're roughly 24 feet away from the channel on Little River. The delineation of this channel is from a plan that this board approved for the dredging project that's gonna happen on Little River. Um, that plans for the town delineated this um, channel pretty well, so we were able to copy it over to this plan and show that we're not any closer than any of the, or at least the neighbor to the south. We also show um, how it aligns with neighboring peers on the project. We did receive comments back from the harbor master that this proposed pier does not um, have any navigational issues on Little River. We did not, however, get any feedback from the shellfish constable. Um, so I don't know if Drew has anything on record, um, but this is, this is the project that, that we're doing. We're just trying to reach adequate water depths from what's currently existing and also propose a pier that is safe. Um, if you look at the details, this is not an overly wide pier. Um, the match fee allows for up to four feet. We're proposing a three foot wide pier. So this is not an overly large um, or wide pier. Of course, it's twice as wide as what's there, but still it's not that wide. Um, I know there's some comments about the potential tree um, where the proposed pier begins. I remember seeing a shrub um, I don't remember a cedar, but um, I know the shrub, it's best just to have the shrub removed and replaced in kind. Um, if we have a cedar, um, the best thing for a pier is just to prune the lower limbs and not, not remove the, the cedar tree. Um, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanna focus on the uh, the public access, the walk around for the pier itself. Um, is that three feet on either side and three feet in front of the entrance to the pier? So right, um, the public access is either to you allow the public, not that people are walking around this marsh, but it's either allow the public to walk all around your structure or to walk up and over your structure or to walk under the structure. So those are the three options. To walk under the structure, we have to elevate this pier about five feet above the marsh, which seems kind of illogical for this situation. To build stairs to walk up and over, it's like introducing more structure on the marsh. Mm -hmm. So with the knowledge that people aren't really walking here, we just want to allow people to just walk up and around. I mean, around. Right. So the way this is drawn, the new pier is not aligned with the old pier. I know you're going to take that all out, but you're proposing that a little bit further northeast of the existing pier. I don't see any way that you can do that without taking that cedar that's there. It's there, I saw it. And it's good size. So how do we deal with that? I guess my, my memory doesn't help me well, but I do remember a, a shrub. I, I remember a cedar. There's a good-sized bayberry, and the cedar's right aside of it. Can, side by the, side. You can see it. Do you have a picture of it? You can see it in the aerial, but it's right there, too. So, yeah. The cedar's right behind the bayberry. 
So if, if you look at that, um, that pier, the beginning of that pier. Yes. We're going to be three feet from the beginning of that pier to the right. To the right. So on the plan, you can see where um, the beginning of the existing pier is, and we're going to be three feet to the right, three plus, and a half feet or so. Plus the three feet to walk around it. Right, but the three feet doesn't mean we're clearing the three feet. It's just that we allow people to walk in that area. It's fully vegetated. It's going to be tougher than to walk through it unless they have a machete. Right, right, but <laughs> public access does not mean that people have to cre create a clear path. Um, people don't go along the shoreline and create a and clear a path for the public to actually walk through. It's just that people are allowed to use that area for public access. Okay. Why not slide that pier over the existing footprint of the pier that's there, and maybe even a little bit further over, and get away from the existing vegetated buffer of that bay berry and cedar and everything else that's in there. Why are you moving it up into an area that's going to have to be, and I don't know how you're going to get it in there without doing damage to what's there. So the, the alignment was based on the 15-foot setback from the projected property line. So that was what I used to align the float and then centering everything else with the float. That's what I used to align the, the pier. Um, I can see uh, we could do a slight rotation from the middle two piles. Um, and if I introduce a slight two degree rotation, I can align with the beginning of the existing pier. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, go ahead. Raul, the way this is shown on the plan, uh, so if you're looking at this right here, can we agree that what is to the left of the pier looks different than what's to the right of the existing pier? Yes. On the plan, if you're looking at this, it looks like it's the same with the way it's drawn, right? With the squiggles that you have representing. So, right, what the plan represents is just the edge of clearing, what the edge of the homeowner has cleared. So from that point forward, what we have on the left is, I believe these are salt marsh grasses. Um, on the right, there's more shrubbery. Right, so that shrubbery has to stay in order for the mitigation plantings that are approved in the previous one that we just approved to actually take and thrive because if they're exposed and if those if, if that's cut back then the plantings that you have proposed are are way more exposed and they don't i mean you you want that buffer there that that's going to help protect this property it's going to help protect this property ultimately so if you're going to build upon that uh, i don't know i I'm struggling with the placement of this one. What was the answer, Mr. Cameron? What was the answer to your your question, which seemed like a very logical remedy? It was the setback issue from the lot. So right, um, I started with the setback, but what what I can uh, agree is at that midpoint um, tandem pier um, piles, um, introduce an angle point. And I don't know if, if you're following me with what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, I can angle. And it's not a substantial angle. I'm talking about probably two degrees, three degrees. Yeah. And from there on, I can align with um, the existing pier. Wouldn't that answer Alex's issue too? More so. Yeah. More so. But, I mean, if you were to build it over what is to the left versus what is to the right, you'd exactly. be doing way less damage. Right. And even just aligning over it, that what's currently there is very skinny compared to what's being proposed. Right. So it's just. Yeah, and going back to what you said, Alex, the two plans don't match up. No. If you look at the previous plan that shows the mitigation and shows that alleyway, and then now this plan's taken away from the vegetation that's there. The right. So the two it's plans the do point. not match up. Th at like all. that's a lot bigger. I think that. Yeah. If we then, can go. Right. right. So if you look plan to plan, they're contradicting each other. 
can we get ZBA relief for that? In other words, because you're going to be you're going to be too close, right? The existing pier. CBA, how how CBA. far is the existing pier? CBA doesn't approve this. Yeah, they won't no. approve the 14. They don't get involved with, with piers. So why do we have to worry about this? Going in straight up fifteen. No, I don't have to. Like, that's oh. why I can I can do this. I mean, angle. I know we oh, you can do it without it. So let's just go over the existing right, pier that's there, like that. Yeah, but that yeah, that one showed new the, the previous right. plan had mm -hmm. new mitigation okay. plantings, but now this plan proposes <coughs> taking away from existing <coughs> mitigation plantings that are the, uh, existing plantings that's there. Right. So, so yeah, one one plan is showing you adding, and this one's taken away. So confusing. You know, if it had it, it was in the same spot, then. Be. So yeah, um, I just not. just heard back from the applicants, and yeah, they're willing to just realign the new pier so that it follows, the old pier. holding the right side but going the three feet to the left. <coughs> yeah. So it'll protect the integrity of the existing bayberry. And so the shrubbery to the north there. stays put. <coughs> yeah. It will um, cover over the salt marsh grasses on the left, on the south. <coughs> And I know these are filed separately, and I, I'm it's neither here nor there that they are. I'm surprised it wasn't just one filing, all on a notice of intent for the dock and the, <coughs> the house and everything else. But is the plan to do the mitigation after all of this dock work is done? I hope, because I can't believe you're going to put all this mitigation on either side of this thing and then have people trouncing around and they're doing all kinds of work. Right. So yeah. so the applicant understands that um, there's two different filings so that one project doesn't hold the other. Mm. But he can start off with the shed relocation that he wants to do. Right. Um, then he can move on to the next structure. <coughs> and he understands that the mitigations are too close to this pier. So he understands we can't close one project without mitigation, but he can't build the pier. Um, after the mitigation. He should build a pier before the mitigation. So he has to work with the time um, with the different projects so that he doesn't affect one or the other. He knows that if the mitigations are put in and the pier gets installed and damages the mitigation, he will not get a COC. Or if he happens after getting a COC, he will be an enforcement order. So he, he understands that because there's a COC for the house project. And if the mitigations are there and he gets a COC, there will be a COC for the pier. So if the COC for the PR sees that the mitigation planting were damaged, then he won't get that COC and gets an enforcement order to replace those plantings. So he, he will have to work with those permits to make sure that he, can, he conforms to all these conditions. It, it was my advice to the applicant and to Raul to file these in separate forms. When I typically have side-by-side -side or multi-projects, we always have separate NOIs in case there's one denial, so I don't get a denial on a multiple project. faceted project. So, and the applicant clearly understands the construction sequencing necessary to preserve the mitigation area. And that will, he'll work with Drew and the contractors will work with Drew to make sure that the construction sequencing makes sense because it's just going to cost him more money if it doesn't and the mitigation doesn't take. So, And also, the <coughs> pier has, the house has other local <coughs> reviews. The right. pier has state reviews. And based <coughs> right. on, the, on the knowledge we've got or the the last few state projects that we've applied for, it's upwards of eight months um, where we can get a permit for the house um, in a few months. Yeah, this pier will require Chapter 91 as well as Army Corps of Engineers approval before it can be built. And the first step, and they're going to ask us, is have you had gone through conservation yet in the Chapter 91 application? Then that, that application will also require that the building department as well as the planning department sign off on the zoning requirements for it as well before it even gets out of the box. So that's why coming to you now was, was really to make sense. So it sets us up for, at least for the pier, separately for, those, that, for the permit, permit process. Any um, other questions from Commissioner? I do have one. Is there any, um, you know, the, I assume that the method for installing these pylons is coming in from Little River on a barge with the crane, but yeah. is there any mitigation for any damage to the, the salt marsh or uh, the land during construction or, I mean, after construction? So the requirement, um, of the typical um, condition for pile installation is that the barge doesn't sit on the marsh, mm. but the, the barge has to access the site during the two hours before and two hours after the high tides. Mm. So those are the sections. Once he sets himself, he drives those piles in, not on the marsh, but from the, the water side. 
Right. So, so even at based on your cross section here, where you have you know two point one feet at low tide, <coughs> even at, you know high tide, you might be four, what four feet. You know that barge will might be sitting on the <coughs> on the the mud. No, no, no. Um, so the the when the barge comes and starts to set up, the barge is not floating. Um, the barge sets itself its own piles, and it okay. becomes a, f a fixed structure. Okay. So the tide comes and goes, um, and he's not floating, um, unless it's one of those small barges that is floating. But the barges that that I've work with and, and seen doing this type of work, um, they fix themselves with... Um, spuds. Yeah, the, 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 the piles themselves. They spuds, and they, they lock them in so the barge doesn't ground out. Okay. Because you don't want the barge moving around while you're driving these piles. Right. So, um, and then I think it's a typical, reg, um, a typical special condition that is in the MASHP peers permits that it happens two hours before and two hours after. It has to be a high tide. Yeah, a high yeah, tide. High tide. <clears throat> there is, um, uh, the shellfish constable did get back today with a mitigation fee of $6,082.56. It's the calculated amount based on multiple species of shellfish in this area. Um, so that is the recommended um, shellfish mitigation fee from, uh, from the shellfish constable. That's acceptable. Okay. Thank you. I also wanted to point out that the, you know, being able to extend the pier out a little bit into the navigable waterway will allow us to have a float system that doesn't ground to the substrate, which is a really valuable uh, change to the shellfish and the wildlife that live in the substrate. So anytime we have, as you're concerned about the barge that's putting in the pilings, well point well taken, this, this dock, this float has been sitting on the ground at low tide for years, I guess. So now it's time the new owner is really willing to get that into some deeper water so that you're not dragging boats through the substrate, you're not allowing that float to ground in the substrate every low tide. It'll help wildlife, nav uh, fish, shellfish, and to be able to circulate along the coast. Okay. In the walkway, I think that Raul had mentioned about, so chapter 91 requires us, as you know well, to uh, allow for public access across the, the, below the mean high watermark, right? Fishing, fouling, right. and navigation. So we have to make sure that there is an area that the general public can go by this dock, this pier, and get around it. In fact, if they can't, technically under chapter 91, if they can't traverse the dock, uh, the pier at the, uh, below the high watermark, they're entitled to actually come up into the yard and go around the pier, and then continue on their way. So it's an important part of the chapter 91, and it will require us to post signs to that effect at the property lines for these for this pier. So, and I can assure you that will be taken care of when we do when we do uh, the chapter 91 licenses. <coughs> Very good. Um, I will entertain a motion if there is. I have one uh, question, Drew's comment. You <laughs> mentioned about four pylons versus two. Do you have a <coughs> concern on that? Yeah, um, I was just wondering if the, if for the float. Configuration could be reduced to two piles instead of four. Is four really necessary? I just think a that question. I, I, would, I would prefer the four from just from a okay. stability standpoint. Yeah. They have okay. Uh, only, I've floated a long time. Yeah. And I was, and of course, at 409, we've been there for two years. Right. And I, and I was surprised at the, the, the amount of current that yeah, it is. Does, yeah. it does flow through the River and in the, the, the flow currently at 409 um, does need to be repaired as a result of the, the pilings are okay. Are What's the top of the piling going to be? Um, 2016 plus one, 16 right. plus three, or something. Way, whenever that's for flood flows, purposes, right? You know, okay. You don't typically see that okay. like at, at a marina, so to speak. No, right. I think the floats are with the, the floats are the the really high. Rollers yeah. on the dock I was just curious. With, <coughs> it would be it, it, the flow would be more stable in, in sure. my opinion. Okay, thank you. <coughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay, then I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we close the issue for Thomas J. Guard, um, MT Guard LC, 411 Montemoscoy Road with the condition of the shellfish mitigation fee of $6,082.56. Okay. Thank you, Brian. And, and amend that and to 
the plan to match yep. the existing dock, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. We want to have, what's it, two degrees or three, you said, on that pivot point? To match the alignment. <laughs> To match right. the don't, don't quote me on the angle, but it's to match the alignment. <laughs> no, we're going to quote you for 1.5. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, with that uh, condition as well. Okay. Is there a second to, to the motion? Motion? Yeah, yeah, second. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Steve. That's the, that's the, that's the Any discussion that we have on the motion? All set, Charlie? All set. Okay. All right, I'll take a roll call vote. Brian? Yes. Alex? Yes. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. Charlie? Yes. I vote yes as well. Motion carries. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, folks. Good night, guys. Yeah. Well navigated. Have a good, have, have a good night. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice job. Yes. <laughs> because of you, I'm going to eat another piece of candy. Oh, well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> the longer I'm going to eat piece of candy, I'm going to need another piece of candy. I know. Feeling good? Candy here, candy here. Okay. Are we on Quaker Run Road? Yes. Next man up. That's right. <laughs> Dan's taking over. Go ahead, Dan. I guess so. I'm going to look at you. <laughs> <laughs> You're so huge. Are they bigger today than So we'll open the 624. Um, Diane Wells, trustee, 28 Quaker Run Road. Okay, this is a uh, proposed construction and maintenance of a single family dwelling, including a garage, deck, patio, in ground. Pool, all associated utilities. Title V septic system, landscaping, hardscaping, pier, ramp, and float. <coughs> Representative Cape and Islands Engineering, a notice of intent. Good evening. Good evening, Mark Tibb again with uh, Cape and Islands Engineering. Uh, here tonight, we filed a notice of intent application for Diane Wells at 28 Quaker Run Road in Mashpee. Um, similar to my last one, I'm just going to give a quick timeline update and then go through existing conditions and proposed conditions. So we did um, originally were set for January 12th hearing. Um, at that time, we hadn't received shellfish and um, harbor master comments. So we did um, continue, and um, we were actually on for the 26th hearing. Uh, we did receive uh, the shellfish letter uh, the, the day of, and I just wanted to correspond with my um, client regarding that, and um, we did have some questions on that letter, so I wanted to work out with staff and, and um, meet with staff and to review that letter thoroughly and just make sure we all understood what was happening. So we did request a second continuance. Um, and then we received an updated letter and we're here tonight to present and go over the, the project. So it is a, um, a new dwelling and pier ramp and float on a vacant lot at 28 Quaker Run. Um, it is on Shoestring Bay. Um, there's land under the ocean, land containing shellfish. There's some areas of salt marsh along the coast. And then we have both the DEP coastal bank that's delineated as well as a Mashpee coastal bank. Um, the proposal is a single family dwelling, um, five bedroom dwelling. Proposed, um, we, the entire project um, is cited so that the 50 foot buffer would remain undisturbed. Uh, with the exception of the, the path uh, to access the dock and uh, ramp and float. Um, and then the dwelling is sited um, roughly 120 feet from the salt marsh, um, about 60 feet from the top of the bank, with the septic system being over, over 200 feet from the salt marsh um, and as far possible as possible on towards... Uh, 
Quaker Run. Um, this this L, this project. Um, there's a substantial bank, so all the all the work associated with the house, the decks, the pool, um, is significantly above floodplain elevation. There's no work regarding the dwelling in the flood zone. Um, you know, it's cited per per the plan that you see there. It has again roof drains, um, septic system, and the house. Um, the pier ramp and float is uh, situated so that the, similar to Raul's project, the, the float itself is centered on the property line extensions. Um, it, it will have uh, stairs leading down the bank. Um, this particular one will be raised. Um, we, uh, a plan revision that we did make was to raise the the lowest part of the structure, six feet in all areas where it's crossing the salt marsh. That was actually a DMF comment. We, we were able to um, implement that uh, change as well as the public access for this one is a little more standard. Um, we're, we're a lot, we have an excess of five feet at mean high water. So it's a, a simple under the, under the pier for public access and then um, you know, the, the rest of the plan is, uh, it's piles, uh, a ramp and float. The float is a, a eight by 25 float, 200 square feet. Um, you'll see we've, uh, shown the neighboring floats for, for use of the Harbor master to review. He has reviewed it and determined, um, no navigational issues with that. Um, we did receive the shellfish mitigation letter um, and my client has agreed to that. Um, I would like to just make two comments regarding that, um, that as, as a consultant, I'd like to just, um, just, just identify two two things on this. The 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 natural resource requirement in their their formula is based on these, and it's written right in their formula that it's the the impact acreage or or square footage times the habitat loss times the market value of species shellfish impacted times twenty. And I just wanted to make a note that. Their letter defined the species that were impacted as um, soft shell clams, I believe, and mussels and, and another item. However, the mitigation is reflecti reflecting cohogs and two species that don't appear to be affected, scallops and oysters. Um, again, we're agreeing to, to the fee. I just wanted to make a note of that. It's the... The formula and the letter just, in my opinion, do not match each other. Um, I just want to bring it to the commission's attention, as well as your the formula in your actual regulation um, has a, so in uh, the DACA regulation, section six mitigation has, has the same formula, and it actually says times 10 shellfish per square feet where the natural resource um, regulation is 20. So I did, I met with um, the director of natural resources and Chris, and we just noted these things. And it's just, again, we, we agreed to pay the fee, but I just want to, I, I'd rather see um, the letter reflect the findings and just be able to, you know, my next project to just manage expectations of my clients and just things like that. Um, and lastly, the, when we first filed, again, we, ha we continued once because of uh, not having the comments and the second time to, to, to review this letter just as kind of I have identified. Drew's initial comment uh, contained a suggestion to add an IA for, for the property because um, it is new construction, five bedroom house, uh, coastal property. Um, at that initial time, I responded to Drew then it was okay to add that, that IA system. Um, and then two weeks later, we got a, a mitigation for $10,000. Uh, Again, 
just a little bit of timing concern on, on my side to, again, manage clients' expectations. I did want to just make a couple comments to the board to see if Drew's suggestion for an IA is, I mean, I know water quality is a big issue. I just wanted to point out a few specific things about this project. Um, the IA is on the plan. Uh, I just wanted to point out that, again, we're over 200 feet away. Um, there's actually a vertical separation for this particular project of almost 36 feet. So, you know, that treatment to, to where our leach field is. And um, this is also in town sewer uh, phase 2A. So, again, that could be <laughs> five or 15 years down the road. So, I just I want to make sure that um, providing an IA is is uh, a suggestion from the commission as well as Drew. Um, again, it's on the plan, um, but uh, I just wanted to make note of this particular project. Is an IA appropriate um, based on this particular parameters of this project? I agree, they're very important. In a, you know, when you're elevation eight or 10, um, this is elevation 40, um, and we have in excess of 200 feet to the salt marsh. Um, otherwise, uh, that is my presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll make a few comments first. I obviously was not at that meeting when the uh, mitigation fee was explained to you. Um, yep. Was there talk about that area being identified as a town shellfish propagation area? There was talk of the importance of the habitat. Right. Um, you know, I, if the if you're if the the calculation said um, instead of species affected, if it mm -hmm. said habitat affected or something to that effect. Right. right. You know, it just it's just what it says and what they found. Uh, are, Two different things. So yes, they, they they described it as very important location for the habitat for in the future, um, and described that it's basically all three of those species are calculated within that area. You know, so it's like three times that for those different species, resulting in the in in that amount. Um, in regards to the IA system, and I know that area that you have located is out of our jurisdiction, um, everybody's well aware of what the DEP is up to these days. And my thought is to you that it would behoove you to really reconsider that. Um, phase 2A is, in my lifetime, <laughs> I'd be surprised to see it. You're a long, long, long way off from wastewater treatment collection in this area. Um, given the fact that we have a successful watershed permit and it goes well, great. But if it doesn't, you end up putting in a Title V system and not that long down the road, you're gonna be taking it out. So it's something to consider. Um, the one thing that I saw when I was on the site, um, Alex, you were there with me on that site visit. When you stand on the bluff and you're looking at the proposal for the pier, I was looking at the trees that are there, and there are some really nice, good-sized trees on that embankment. I would hate to see any of those go, and I could see a pathway through a couple of, I'm gonna say they were at least 12 to 14 inch diameter trees and there was one tiny small white oak that was coming up between the pathway that I could see. And it appeared to me as though the angle of the pier could go through that pathway and only sacrifice in that one small, I believe it was a white oak. Mm -hmm. But when I'm looking at the plan and I had it on my iPad when I was out in the field, it didn't look to me as though it was going to line up that way. So my concern is to preserve those trees that are on that embankment that have, you know, 10, 12, 14, I didn't measure them, but they're, they're good-sized trees. I would hate to see any of those coming down uh, to facilitate this 
peer proposal, because I think you've got plenty of room, unlike the last hearing, that you know they have to do a pin and trying to angle it so tight. This is not that tight. So um, I'm just throwing that out there, that I, I would not want to see those bigger trees come down. And with that, I'll open it up to other commissioners that have questions, if you're on the site, or based on the proposal that we have before us. Can I make a comment? I just wanted to sure. kind of reiterate what you two have just said. I was out there today, and um, there are the two large trees. I took some pictures. There's a bunch of bird nests. You know, I live looking out over Shoestring Bay, and I've much further, you know, closer up towards Quinnequisset. We're in the condos there. But one of the things we love about it is the bird life and the, and the, the birds you can hear. So I guess when I hear trees coming down, I think of nests going away. I think of birds and the sounds and the things that I love about living in this area disappearing. So that's a concern for me, and I just wanted to say that I agree as well. Right. There should be a different plan. Well, there are a lot of trees that will be coming down, obviously, because the house is being proposed. And when I look down the embankment, I see trees that let's work with them and see if we can't um, get those, get that ramp. There it is right there. Yep. There's a, you see that small, tiny, if you move the cursor a little bit more down, no, over here, look, there's a little tiny, it's probably about a four inch. This one here? Uh, no, come on over to the right, right there. Yep. See that little yep. one right there? Mm -hmm. If that got clipped out of there, I'm wondering if the ramp, the pier, couldn't get down through those trees without sacrificing any of those trees. I would not want to see, I mean, there's so many options there to, to get that. Is this a four foot wide ramp? Yep. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of options there. So um, depending on, and I can't really tell, so, you know, unless we're right on the site with the surveyor. So for the sake of this, would we condition it to site the pathway and the, and the steps to take out as few trees as possible. Right. Have, have one of our agents on the site mm -hmm. um, yeah, as a so follow-up yeah. and, and try to locate that pier to save those mature trees that are there. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was one of my concerns when, when I was out there. Other questions and comments? Um, I had a question on uh, going back to the IA. <clears throat> System, I was a little confused by your commentary, so I just want to make sure that you get an opportunity to clarify. You sort of link the issue of what you think might be a miscalculation on the mitigation fees. Um, and I suspect you did that so that the commission could consider, which as you know, we don't do that. None of us were there at the time, but are you suggesting that there's not some parity there and you want to have that adjusted and you somehow linked it to, and we've got the IA. Is the IA in or is it out? Um, it's on the plan, so it's in. Um, we don't plan to, uh, it's in by way, you'll see the, the fat, it's on the septic tank, it's yeah. called out uh, fast yeah. septic tank. Um, otherwise, <laughs> I don't Were we, you suggesting you'd like to take it out? Uh, well, it was, if we had received all the comments at once, um, we may not have quickly agreed to the IA, just because the shellfish is, is $10,000, an implementation of an IA is $15,000. Um, we just, the, the IA comment came in prior to the very first hearing from Drew. It was a suggestion, it wasn't a requirement. And then uh, the shellfish letter came two weeks later and this is our, as a company, this is prior, other than the one you just heard, um, we never had a shellfish letter exceed about $2,500 for, for floats that were much bigger and much larger. Um, so, you know, there was a shock, and, and even the first shellfish letter said $16,000. However, there was a calculation error in that letter. So we just, yeah, um, that's what I'm implying. The timing didn't help my decision to relay information to the client, but we agree, we are agreeing to the shellfish mitigation as well as the IA is on the plan. Um, I was, you know, if, if, if one of you had suggested for this particular site an IA might not help, 
then maybe we would take it away, but we're just going to leave it in. Since you know you're... I would never suggest it. <laughs> <laughs> My client has agreed clients. to both the IA and the mitigation. Um, just end, know, it, end I, it there. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to, sh to share with you. I think you could, <laughs> I know it's hard to say, you could be the leader here. Um, the IA, it seems crazy not to. It just seems given the time, the calendar, what's happening on the state level, uh, and given the importance of the issue and a brand new construction, it just seems insane not to. Uh, and number two, I know it's dollars and cents, and I'm sure that it, your company, you're always trying to do the right thing, best product by your customer at the best price, but um, if you read the New York Times article, and I don't run my life by the Times articles, but the pictures in there from Mashpee uh, show our agent holding up what is the result of a great deal of pollution and everything that you're very familiar with, right outside um, the coastal area, and the sludge had had killed the mussels. They're gone. So the mitigation fees aren't, they're not just to say, oh, you know, a slap on someone's wrist. They're actually our future. Both of those issues, it's just my opinion as a commissioner that both of those issues are the future of Mashpee. We just had a hearing, the Mashpee quality of water. And I'm just saying, this is one commissioner. I don't want to go forward. It's just come from that telling everybody, we're all doing the right thing here by keeping the waters clean and doing everything we can to move forward with new construction and not require it. And I, is, I just think that, for me, the ultimate hypocrisy is crazy. And the fees, I'm sorry if you think that you were unfairly, <laughs> uh, your formula wasn't applied properly. I wouldn't want anyone to unfairly be <clears throat> uh, assess something that, that wasn't uh, in some way backed up by their formula. That's what they meant to do. That's what they intended to do. But having said that, I don't think there should be any connection with uh, mitigation issues and how we feel as a commission for any homeowner, for any new, particularly new construction. I wouldn't sleep well tonight. Well taken. So la di da. Yeah. Mark? Yeah, just one, uh, yes, I, you know, I, I agree with everything. Um, it just, you know, if, if, if we did not accept the shellfish mitigation, I just, there could be grounds to win an appeal if, if the paperwork does not match the formula. That's all. I, I'd like to see it just coordinated so that it just adds up. You know, I, you know, it says species affected. However, it says right in their report, different types of species are affected than the ones. So, you know, it, it, it was just this, almost a suggestion, I guess, just to, to nail down um, the formula. And in fact, your regulations actually have a, it was described as a typo, basically, when we did meet to discuss about it. So that was my only, uh, you know, just a solid coordination of, of of the paperwork, uh -huh. that's all. But the bottom line is you and the shellfish constable are in agreement yes. with the fees that, I mean, I'm looking at the figure here on the screen, $10,520.45. Correct. Okay. All right. Yeah, for those reasons, I think we should move forward. Um, and if there are conditions, I think that the conditions should be included instead of continuing it. Um, because, you know, he said if he had known that prior to, and they're keeping the IA system in there. Right. So I think that, you know, we should act on this. Okay. With that said, okay. yes, Aaron. I just wanted to clarify, your, I saw the real estate sign uh, the, out in front. Your client purchased this property or your client is selling this property? Is selling. So this, okay, so this is just for like a spec? Correct. For whoever might buy it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I would entertain a motion uh, on the project as proposed. Is there a condition that you had yeah. about moving the tree or something or moving? For the staff to cite the 
the location of the pier. To cite the location with the of least the amount of trees yeah, taken the down. Yeah, location of the steps. To you can do it. Out. <laughs> I'll, make, I'll make a motion to close an issue for 28 Quaker Run Road um, with the condition to work with the staff to cite the steps going down the coastal bank to impact as few trees as possible. Um, I think that was it, right? We've got the mitigation. Mitigation fee. For the shellfish. Okay, and um, with the condition of the shellfish mitigation fee of $10,520.45. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Second. Thank you, Brian. Any further discussion on the motion that we have? By the Can I ask a question of you, Mr. Yes. Chairman? Of you. Say it again. Can we assume that everything that's in here it doesn't have to be cited as a condition that he is going to include the FAST system, the IA system? Yes, so it's on the plan. It's in the plan. It's on the plan. And, that, and that's what yes. we're approving yes. as is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Any other discussion? Charlie? No. No? All set? Okay. Um, just taking a minute to look over my notes here on the screen. Can I ask a dumb question? I'm sorry. <laughs> We're still in discussion, Aaron. Okay. Sure. There are no dumb <laughs> the questions. New, the new owner would have to follow whatever we approve, right? This Absolutely. Would be, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's an order of conditions that would be recorded at the registry and Okay. It would be ongoing for a three-year time period, uh, so they'd have to follow it. Sure. Yeah, if they have a different footprint or something, they'll have to come back. Okay. Come back for an amendment possibility or something to that that nature. <laughs> uh, I'm just, I'm looking at, um, we're still in discussion. I'm looking at Drew's recommendation and uh, the project proposes to maintain a 50 foot wide naturally vegetated buffer strip as per regulatory standards on an undeveloped lot. Pathway stairway of four foot width through the buffer strip is allowed per regulation 29. So we're in agreement that this is a four foot wide pier yep. and conservation staff is gonna direct which trees stay which trees can go the most beneficial route to take down that embankment yes okay. as well it is noted a four foot wide path too when up above the pier mm -hmm. so yes four yes. foot wide mm -hmm. okay okay no further discussion and it may not be a straight line it depends. just saying like i'm here like yeah it's like in ideally but it may Correct. have to jog a little bit right yeah okay. Here can't do a lot of jogging though. That would have to the be. The stairs got enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No further discussion on the motion. I will call for a vote. I'm sorry. Brian. Yes. Thank you, Alex. Yes. Marjorie. Yes. Yeah. Aaron. Yes. Steve. Yes. Thank you, Charlie. Yes. Thank you, Charlie. I vote yes as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have Commissioner Fatigue. The marathon <laughs> continues. That's all, Mr. Chairman. This meeting going so late. It's a, it's a long, long night. night. What's for dinner, Paul? <laughs> What's that? What's for dinner? <laughs> there is no dinner. We have, a, we have another hearing for dinner, is what we have. <laughs> I can't eat that. Okay. <laughs> Now calling the 627 hearing for Daniel D. McMacken and Lauren W. Morris, 14 Grand Vista. This is a proposed modification to an existing landscaping and hardscaping. The representative is Baxter Nye Engineering and Surveying, and this is an amended order of conditions, DEP number 433142. Do we have someone to represent? Good evening. Can, I, can you hear me okay? This is Matthew Eddy with Baxter Engineering. Can yes, okay? we can hear you perfectly. 
All righty, thank you. Thank you. I'll, uh, thank you for uh, hearing me tonight, and I will try to keep this brief. I believe this is fairly straightforward, and I know you've had a long evening. Um, this is a uh, an amended order of conditions request for 14 Grand Vista. Um, the this is a uh, lot in Willow Bend. Um, the changes proposed are fairly minor, uh, minor changes in hardscape, which are mainly there's a shell driver that's proposed to the right side of the garage that you can see, that constitutes the majority of the uh, the hardscape change. Um, this lot uh, is all in the outer riparian, so we're not in the hundred foot, and there's no hundred foot. Uh, a buffer to bordering vegetated wetland, uh, and we're outside of the uh, inner riparian. So again, uh, it's in the kind of outer half of the outer riparian zone. Um, and then the main request here was modification to the uh, limit of work. Um, the uh, homeowner and applicant uh, has requested a little bit of additional clearing. Um, what we had submitted to you and had proposed is, you can see on the plan, uh, there's the lighter gray line, which is the approved limit of work, and then there's the darker black line, uh, that's the double dash line, that was the uh, new proposed limit of work. Um, I had a conversation with Drew earlier today, um, and he, he and I uh, kind of, well, it was more of an emailing it through, I'll say. And uh, he was not supportive of the additional clearing in the rear of the lot, so at the at the north end of the lot. Uh, so I've agreed that uh, we would kind of take that off the table, if you will, and so that the um, additional limit of work area is just on either side of the house, just so that you have this better access around the house for getting around the house. And that would really be the, the extent of it. Um, so with that, the, be happy to answer any questions that you would have. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so we're going with that lighter gray dashed line as the area for the limit of work? If you go, well, no, it's going to be a combo of it. Um, Dan, if, could you go to the second sheet, the landscape plan? That might be a little bit easier to see. Yeah, there you go. So if you... You see the, uh, the, the lawn edge in the back of the house? Yep, see where it says lawn and there's that solid black line? You got it right there. That's the, that's the edge of lawn. So Drew, in my discussions with him, we agreed to that. And then up going up the sides of the house, the limit of work will be pushed out along the sides of the house. But then in the rear of the house, where we were going to clear, where we were requested to clear further back in the, in the rear of the house, there you go. All of that area will take off the table. So basically, it, it will follow the gray line, if you will, on the back, but then follow the edge of lawn and then wrap back into the you know, side property line or the or the proposed limit of work on the side of the house. Okay. And that, Can I ask a question, uh, Mr. Chairman? I think, you know, um, if Drew's not here, maybe um, Dan can answer this question. He said this would likely need to have a continuance. I'm assuming it's because what's before us um, is going to be amended again. So shouldn't we just continue and have him come back with an amendment instead of just saying I'm taking it off the table? I'm coming back with a new plan. Um, yes and no. So he's taken that part off the table where they wanted to just reorganize the natural buffer zone beyond right. the work limit. Um, but what Drew has also pointed out. Um, is the 5,000 square foot area limit. Um, since this is a riverfront, you can only do 5,000 square feet right. of modification. Um, and he wants and he wants a number. Is it 5,000? Is it below? Is it above? Um, is really yeah, which is missing from this one. Um, from, the, from Drew's notes, yes. Yeah. So I don't see how we can deal with it. I mean, yeah, I think I have the same concerns because I think these things need to be addressed. And I think that moving forward, like, we should have a process you know, for the department to vet these applications and things because if they don't answer all of the questions, I don't feel comfortable moving forward with anything until they've addressed if, all of the if I, If I may, that information is provided in the narrative letter. In the narrative I'm sorry, what did you say? In the narrative letter. <laughs> well, I read the narrative the letter, but it's part of the application information submitted. Well. And the reason this is a second amendment is if within Willowbend, 
will have been before the lots were developed. They did order a conditions for all of the lots out there, and, and they had they got what was referred to as a generic approval for each of the lots. Once they then sell the lots, and they have a a new homeowner who's now going to actually you know has the plans of how they want to develop the lot. We then come in with those actual plans and amend the original order of conditions. That's the only reason that you see a prior or amended order of conditions. This, re this amended request here, again, I, I think is, is very uh, minimal change. Just as you know, the house is under construction, it's near completion, there was just some adjustments that they were hoping to make out there. So the adjustment is from 3,599 square feet to 4,066, is that correct? Um, in regarding to, for, for, what are you referring to? I'm sorry. Um, I'm referring to the uh, letter that you said, the narrative letter that came with this filing. Those are the figures that I see that on it. Is in the, hold on, let me get it to the letter if I could. That is the change in hardscape, that's correct, was uh, 3,599 square feet previously, it's now at 4,066 uh, square feet, and as I had stated, the, that change, the majority of that is the, uh, the seashell driveway, and then there's also the stairs that are added on the deck and the rear going down to the lawn, that constitutes the change in the hardscape. So then the total amount of alteration is 4066 no that's the that's the total amount of hardscape right. um, within okay. the lot the if so you look down further uh, this paragraph below that um, work within the um, outer right parent is 5866 square feet the, it's over the 5,000 square feet this is a dialogue right. that I've had with the Commission previously and with drew. Willow Bend was done as an approved as a open space development, as I'm sure you're aware. And so the rear of all of these lots have already um, conserved the uh, natural open space. So that's why the lots in Willow Bend as a cluster and open space uh, subdivision and development, the lots are smaller just as far as the actual lot size that each individual homeowner owns. And uh, so with that, the dialogue that I've had with Drew is there is additional area un under the Rivers Act, you have 5,000 square feet on a lot where you can do 10% of an overall riverfront area. When you look at uh, the riverfront area along Grand Vista within Willow Bend, um, the allowable uh, square footage if you take 10% of that area would be over 5,000 square feet per lot. That's the, that's the reasoning there. So we're proposing 5,866 square feet. But are these the numbers after, uh, before you spoke with Drew or after you spoke with Drew? Five, the 5,866 is the number that it does not count doing that, the clearing. The clearing that we were proposing in the rear of the lot, which that was then going to be revegetated. It was just we felt that we were going to be able to enhance the, the, the uh, riparian area, actually. Um, but Drew just wasn't comfortable with that. He wasn't supportive of it, so I said I'd take that off the table. So not just, if we just hold that lawn line, uh, which is basically a line, that, the gray line in the rear, and then just extending it out to the sides, that's the 5,866 square foot number. Okay. But going back to what Brian said is, should we have this plan revised to show, okay, you're going to move that gray line towards the property line on both sides of the house, but then you're going to match the gray line along the lawn on the back. So should this plan be amended before we Yeah, I mean, what I'd propose, if I could, is um, to just, you know, make that amendment to the plan, uh, the revision of the plan, uh, you know, in consultation with uh, staff. Um, and it would just be a simple modification to just, you know, hold that, that back line and not, and remove the, uh, the revegetated area in the rear that we we're proposing. Yeah, but does that change the square foot calcs or not? No, it'll be that 5,866 number. 
So it's still over five thousand. Yeah, do we not understand so that? I mean, can we, Dan? What would be the um, next date in time for the next continuance if we do move forward with the continuance? Um, it would be February twenty third at six twenty four. Because we, we need to clarify this. Um, it's in excess of five thousand, and there is a recommendation from the agent to require a continuous to get this situation squared away. So, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to um, continue the hearing for Daniel D. and Lauren W. Morris at 14 Grand Vista to February 23rd at 6.24 p.m. Second. Second. Thank you. Third, fourth. Is there, is there a... Um, Discussion or comments on the motion for a continuance? Yeah, I have, I have a yes, discussion or Brian. a comment. I think that moving forward, I think that we need to apply this across the board. I don't know how many times I've seen since I've sat here, people just come forward with different proposals. They're giving us different things that the department doesn't have. I think that that all needs to go through the department, and I don't consider that, you know, fully, you know, vetted applications, you know, so they're going to come back. I don't think that we should just be receiving documents here at the meeting because some of us, you know, like to take our time and do our due diligence. So when you're showing us different plans, it's very confusing. And, you know, I just want to reiterate that for the record. And disrespectful. Right. This cover letter is dated January 24th um, oh, with the if, numbers. If I may real quick, so for sure. this continuance, There's what, a motion uh, what am I coming back with? What are you requesting me to come back with? An accurate application. Oh, no, just a revised I'm plan. Sorry? Right? Revised, right. revised plan. Just and revising that limit of work along the back edge there. And no more than 5,000 right. square feet of alteration. All right, well, I'll have to talk that through with Drew then. If we stay at the 5,000, we'll just be, that'll be the, the prior plan then. So there would be, the, so just go ahead, go ahead and you know, continue it, and I will, I'll have dialogue with Drew. If we're staying right at the 5,000, that's what that prior plan that's been approved already is at. <laughs> Right. That it may not be amended because if it's... Yeah, so we, yeah, so I'll talk it through with Drew and it may not be, you know, we may just end up withdrawing the continuance if, if we're not going to be allowed to have any... any uh, Could you, I'm sorry, could you come closer house. to your phone or your microphone and speak a little bit slower? It's hard to hear you. I just want to hear your response. Can you hear me response. a little bit better right now? Yeah. Well, just slow down just a bit, please. Yeah, I just said that I will review it with Drew if you're saying that... We're going to be held to the 5,000 square foot than the prior plan that was approved, um, you know, under the order of conditions. That uh, limit of work was at 5,000 square feet already. So if we're not going to be allowed to go over that number, um, that we may not need to. I mean, we'll do the continuance now, but we may end up withdrawing it because if we have to keep it at the 5,000 square feet, that's what the existing current approved plan is at. Right. Yeah. Okay, then. Okay. Um, I will take a roll call vote on the motion. Brian? Yes. Thank you. Alex? Yes. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. Charlie? We don't have Charlie anymore. Uh, Charlie. Oh, yeah. Charlie? Can we have your vote on the continuance? Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Thank you. I vote yes as well. Motion carries unanimously. Everybody, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. All righty, thank you. Thank you, man. Mr. Chairman. Well, I made a mess of my binder tonight. Um, just a point of order. Just because of the interest of time, um, I don't know about the pre and post agenda items, but the request for the vote of endorsement, I did hear Sue or somebody say that there were citizens petitions that were filed, I believe, for both of these um, matters. So should we leave them on the agenda to vote on them um, and support them or support the petition citizens? Yeah, I think, I think we need to... Because I don't want to leave tonight without taking a vote on this before right. we adjourn. If the no. draft articles Absolutely are added Absolutely not. For um, let me back up. Hold on. Under communication and correspondence, there is a request for vote of endorsement for the 2023 Maytown meeting. It is for the proposed article to restrict boat horsepower on Santuic Pond to more 
to no more than 10 miles per hour, uh, and this is through the Mashpee Department of Natural Resources. So we, you have in your packet, I believe, the article itself. You have that in your binder? I mean, I'm, yeah. Regulation 30, draft article. No, hold on. Yes. Yeah. It's a DNR article number one. It's got a description on it for Chapter 170, uh, Section 19, Santuit Pond Prohibited Uses. And I know in our, um, in our agenda, it's referring to 10 miles per hour, but in the article itself, we're talking about 10 horsepower Different. Outboard motors. Yeah. I mean, outboard motors are, are very easy to acquire at 9.9. .9. They, they make them all the time to get under that 10 horsepower. Uh, and I know this article, when it first started, go back to last October, it was 5 horsepower, yeah. and it's been now moved up to 10. And most of the language that's in here is still pretty consistent with what we had before. Okay. So if there's... Um, any questions or comments on the letter itself? What I would entertain is a, a motion um, of endorsement by the commission for the draft article that the DNR is proposing, DNR article number one. I'll put a motion on the table to endorse that. Okay. Thank Second. you, Alex. A second. I look like there was more there, but I, I can't remember. <laughs> But I couldn't quite pull it out from the back of my brain. <laughs> Commission <laughs> overload. Once we go beyond nine. Yeah. yeah, I see. But we still have a couple more important things to do. I so, um, Is there a second to that second. motion? Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> Any discussion? On I do want to say, yeah, I have something to add for discussion. That attending the selectmen's meeting where actually had, um, I think it was Fuss and O'Neill. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Present on this topic was brilliant. It was eye-opening. Um, they were great presenters and understanding where this comes from. It's not arbitrary. It's not targeting and punishing voters. It's, we're not taking away people's ability to still get out on the water. They can, there's other ways of getting out there and we're helping keep the sediment from being redistributed up into the water column and um, I'm just really happy that we're supporting this. Mm -hmm. You know, un until we um, until we get wastewater relief, uh, not only in phase one but multiple phases, including the ponds, um, we have to look as carefully as we can at what I would like to label as no-cost options. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of different things that we should be doing and encouraging people to do, and we heard it loud and clear tonight in mm -hmm. that discussion forum. Um, so I. I don't want to amend your motion, but I wholeheartedly support uh, this, this draft article. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I will take a vote. Brian? Yes. Thank you. Alex? Yes. Thank you. Marge? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. Charlie? I have to say no to this. Okay. Thank you. And I vote yes. Motion carries. All right, that's out of the way. Um, let me go back to this. Um, I you want to go back and do the regulations. Yes, I want to look at um, the bylaw review subcommittee updates, regulation five, which is the fee schedule, the proposed permit fee increases. Um, I'd like to have a brief discussion on that article first. Um, and then we would um, have this in preparation for public comment. So that's also in your packet. I know there was some talk about adjusting the fee for after the fact filing. And I think that's been adjusted. 
and all of the fees are listed out there for you. If there's any questions or comments on the draft that we have before us? So, Mr. Chairman, what would we be looking for here? Well, under the pre and post agenda items, we have a discussion based on the draft that's before us. And if everybody is okay with that draft, I would go to the end of our agenda where we have a 633 Town of Mashpee public comment for proposed amendments to regulation filing fees and regulation 30. Let's just do five for now. Um, and if we're okay with it, we can open it up to public comment. There's not a lot of public here. <laughs> The newspapers here, which is always good, in the audience, and <laughs> and we're on television, which is always good. Mm. Um, I won't entertain a motion to um, vote for this as of yet. I, you know, I wanted you guys to be okay with the draft. I don't know if you are or not. We haven't crossed that bridge yet with the filing fees, let alone Regulation 30. But once I know you're okay with that stuff, then um, I would prefer to have it on our next agenda as a public hearing, public comment, so that we have the two-week window to adjust and think about everything that we have here, and then listen to the public, and then we can move on. it. So with that being said, we could do a motion to accept the draft as presented and then place on the next agenda? Yes. That's okay. That would be my motion um, for Regulation 5, the fee schedule. Okay. Can I so we have a motion on Regulation 5 to accept it as drafted. There's a there's a mistake in the there is a mistake and category we're category four there's just the math is wrong and where do we see that Aaron I'm sorry um, category four down the bottom it says uh, six ten and after the fact eleven twenty shouldn't it be twelve twenty if it's double I'm not a math person but six ten times two is twelve twenty not eleven twenty yes that would be twelve twenty you're right. <laughs> Yep. It's usual for me to catch a map. Yeah. Catch Aaron. That's time I had my pocket calculator out. Okay. Duly noted. Hold on. Let me mark that. Okay. Well, so. I'll make the motion to um, for the draft with edits. As amended? <laughs> yes. By Aaron. Mr. Chairman, how do these um, fees match up with uh, neighboring towns for fees and so forth? I, I know the old fee structure, we were um, quite a bit behind neighboring towns. Now, whether this has brought us up to equivalency with them or not, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, but I know Drew went over this um, several times, uh, and in the bylaw review subcommittee, we had talked about it, and we had moved them up, and then we realized even the first time we moved them up, we weren't even meeting the costs for the fuel of the trucks and the advertisement and everything else, so they went up a little bit higher. Okay. And uh, everybody is fairly comfortable with these at least paying the bills. We're not making any money on it. We're yeah. basically yeah, brought it up to yeah. even par. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and of course, six months from now, we, <laughs> we might be right back in the right. same problem. Yeah. Who knows? I looked at a lot of the other towns. Um, we're some of the bigger towns it's still less than their fees. In some of the other towns, it might be like slightly higher, but um, we do have kind of like fail safes in there. So if like someone's just trying to do the right thing and they have a dead tree that they want to take down, like that's something that the agent will do with them that doesn't come to us with the cost. So okay. there are, um, and other towns would charge for that. So I think it's okay. So we're on par with yeah. Like some of it so in the same ballpark, time. basically. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's good. Okay. And I had suggested at one point, uh, not that far back, that um, we would have some kind of language for an exemption of the fee for anybody that would be filing that is below Barnstable County AMI. Uh, and it wasn't, the theory was that it's really not necessary. Somebody comes in and they're having a hard time, we can actually just talk that through. Yeah. I don't think we need the language in Regulation 5 to state okay. that. Okay. So let me take a vote on this. Brian? Yes. Thank yes. you. Alex? Yes. Thank you. March? Yes. yes. Aaron? Yes. 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 Steve? Yes. yes. Charlie? Yes. Thank you. I vote yes as well. We so. have a second on that. 
Yes, Marjorie. Okay. Orange. Sorry, what? Yes, of you course. Say. I did. <laughs> okay, sure. So that's regulation five. Regulation 30 is also in your packet. And I know the, uh, the bylaws review subcommittee has been working on regulation 30 for ooh, more than six months. Mm. It, it's been it a like long. It's been two years. It, I don't know. <laughs> it longer than I've been here. It, it's, been, it's been a long <laughs> haul. And uh, we were hung up for the longest period of time on uh, parts per million. Um, a little bit of history. The old Regulation 30 was rescinded in April of 2017 because it was at 5 milligrams per liter. And back in 2017, uh, you just couldn't attain that. So we had a law, basically, that was unenforceable. So we've done our homework here, and we've... Uh, cleaned up a lot of the language in here and included some more definitions that I think will be very helpful for the average person reading this. The format is now starting to fall in line with the format of many of the regulations that we have. And the parts per million, as I'm sure you've seen, is 19 milligrams per liter. Um, and that's not just for the septic tank. That's for all forms of nitrogen coming off of the lot, whether it's stormwater runoff, whether it's fertilization, whether it's um, hardscape, you name it. It's the total amount of nitrogen that's coming off of that lot and finding its way into the resource area. And in certain areas that are more delicate than others, there is um, a more stringent standard that the commission may set to reduce in a range of down to 5 to 18 milligrams per liter. And you'll see that in uh, subsection C under performance standards. All in all, I, I think um, the subcommittee has done a great job with this thing, and it's something that is desperately needed, uh, especially in light of the fact of what we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis with our water quality. So with all of that, if you're comfortable, um, I would entertain a motion to accept this draft as presented. So I have a question, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, so it was saying that, um, that we have to limit down to 19 milligrams per liter. Is that totally under the uh, coverage of an IA system versus a standard Title V system, which doesn't denitrify? A standard Title V system uh, has a range on it anywhere from 26 to roughly 45, 46. Um, and this, of course, would negate any kind of a Title V system being able to be used uh, because the Title V system alone would be over the limit. Right. Not to mention any other forms of nitrogen coming off of that lot. So this is mandating so this, IA systems. This basically puts you into IA system territory. Okay. And how many IA systems that the state has approved that meets this requirement? I don't have the exact number, but I know there are many. Okay. Some of the systems that were just presented here tonight uh, fall into I'll that category. Meet, meet all that requirement. Yes. Okay. And um, I think currently there's three or four newer systems that the DEP is still not certified yet, but they're right on the brink. And okay, so there's a multitude of there's many systems that a ho homeowner can choose from. Right. I, I'm to meet this requirement. Let me say there's at least five or eight of them, maybe more. Okay. There's quite a few. You on the DEP website, they're all listed there. Yeah, so in, there's, there's no uh, difficulties in, in obtaining one of these systems, or they're not... No, so. and this regulation would not, like, shoehorn somebody right into a particular system. It's not like we're right. saying, this is what you need. You have multiple <laughs> options, sure. right? there are many options okay. there. Yep. And does this address, uh, and that includes fertilizer, too, it, or not? Uh, no, fertilizer? the fertilizer is regulation 31. 31. Uh, we okay. haven't tackled so that one yet. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so much fun, right? Yeah. In fact, we've talked um, already once these, now that these, we've finished our work with these, we're going to move on to Regulation 25 because that seems to come up every time we meet. Land subject to coastal flow and 31. What did you say? So I guess the 31 is not next. Oh, 31 comes yeah. after 25. 25 and 31, I think we want to do, and uh, even 29, you know, which is the buffer setbacks. Uh, but anyways, we're looking at 30. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chairman, yes. I make a motion that we accept um, the Regulation 30 Prevention of Pollution draft as presented. Thank you, Brian. Second. Thank you, Marjorie. Any further discussion? 
Hearing none. Brian, your yes. vote. Thank you. Alex? Yes. Thank you. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Thank you, Charlie. I vote yes as well. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. One last bit of... We're cruising. I'm moving it right We're along cruising. now. Are you kidding? We've been there three days. <laughs> <laughs> it's, already, it's already Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> just don't take my Valentine's candy that's on this desk. I'm going back. Hold on. Let me just get back We're to. We're just getting loopy now. Yeah. Well, my sugar level is now at It's, it's been a long <laughs> night. You see why I said what I said? That we need to do that first? Because yeah. could you imagine if we did that now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, might have been a good thing. I don't know if we'd have everybody still here, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I'm looking on the agenda for articles, the warrant articles, hold on. Um, so under the bylaw review subcommittee updates that we just finished, regulation five and 30, uh, the next part of that agenda item is a discussion on the expansion of the buffer zone from 100 feet to 150 feet. Um, we have two draft articles. Um, this is for Chapter 172, the bylaw, not anything to do with our regulations. This is the bylaw itself. And Chapter 172-2 is for the jurisdiction language of the bylaw. And Chapter 172-7 is for the permits, determinations, and conditions of the bylaw. And unlike as I mentioned in the discussion forum, unlike regulations that we can work with under home rule authority, uh, these are not. These are bylaws that have to be approved and moved on. Uh, so we have some draft language here for you to look at. And the only bridge that's left to cross is whether we want to accept these articles and move them forward and move them forward to the May 2023 town meeting or move them forward for October. Uh, I've read these five, six, eight, I don't know how many times. I've read them and read them and read them. And uh, my personal feeling is that we should move both of these articles forward for the May meeting. Um, it's already been told to us that there are citizens' petitions out there that are going to do this regardless. Um, and I really think it's our responsibility as stewards of our environment to take our job seriously. We have the language here. It's done. All the figures have been adjusted. And um, I would be happy to entertain a motion to move them to May rather than October. But I'll entertain any motion that comes before me. So with that, so just well, I feel oh. like everyone else. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Mark. Sure, I'd, and I'd then I've got it. I'm going to turn it to you for the motion. But um, uh, I've read through it seven or eight times as well, and I think you've done so much work, Mr. Chairman. You've done so much work, and May should be what we shoot for. That's my personal opinion. Go. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, kind of to that point. I feel like. With the citizens petition or articles, you know, if they're mirror articles to this, um, I could see us, you know, supporting the citizen petition or articles and moving this one to October, you know, playing devil's advocate here, assuming that it doesn't pass in May, we're going to have to go back in October anyways and just try to do it again if we wanted to. So, I mean, I don't know. I feel, yeah, it's hard. So I feel like we have the momentum. Yeah. I feel like we have, I have, we have people <clears throat> wanting to help us educate, wanting to stand behind us at town meeting. I feel like it'll be a lot of work in the next eight weeks um, to get this people in the town to understand it. Um, it feels, I hear you, you're, I hear that you want it to be strategic to get it passed. Right. Yeah, because we see how town meeting is. You'll be there all night, and then it's like the citizen petitioner articles are all the way at the end. So it's like, you know, I don't want to add articles and warrants that are going to 
you know, they're the so, same. So they're if, the same. If the if the if it's petitioned anyway, then you're saying you know it can get passed anyway without us putting it forward. And I haven't seen the citizens petition, so that's what I'm saying. If it mirrors ours exactly, right. then therefore, like I feel like we can leave this item and maybe table this um, because I believe the select board also um, can bring articles after the deadline anyways. So, they can. yes. So we can get our liaison to do that, and the citizens petition articles have already been submitted. So there is a petition that's been submitted already outside of our draft that we're voting on right now. So that's why I think I'd recommend that. So can I play the devil's advocate to your devil's advocate? Always. <laughs> Is that ever done? I'll be exactly done. Always. Um, I think May is better for two strategic reasons. Your thinking is good, but I think we miss an opportunity that we'll never get back to be leaders. Not just to be leaders, but to have the enthusiasm and back yeah. of 13 to 15 different citizens group. And they are good. They know how to run a campaign. And if we're sort of dragging around and it does pass, then we really have egg on our face. You know, oh, great. Right. And great. they say, and they lose, I think, number two. And I think this is yeah. something that's important to all us. They lose a little faith in, in our right. leadership. And our, 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 we say a lot. We say, oh, we're the stewards. But if we're not the leaders and we're out there doing the tough work, um, I, I think it hurts us in terms of our, the esteem in which they will or will not hold us. Uh, yeah. and, and I think our chances of, of getting it, the vote passed yeah. are exponentially larger when we have the advocates with us. Yeah. yeah, I see it as the other way kind of too. Like we're supporting the citizens in their petitioner article versus us putting in our own petitioner's article. Yeah. So you just argued against yourself, Mr. Devil. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that's what yeah, I said. Another point that yeah. I would like you to think about is um, – we basically haven't had a winter. Tomorrow the temperatures are supposed to be 60 degrees. I can't imagine what this summer is going to be like. And if we can get some extra buffer to mitigate what's going into the waters, uh, we, we know we're going to have all kinds of problems this summer. I just, I know it's coming. And if the summer is anything like the winter, it's going to be really hot. So I think we should just put all our ammunition on the table and let's just bring it forward. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of time so between now months. and May. I mean, yeah, I, I mentioned this before. Uh, it's it's only early February. You could almost take a college semester course in the length of time yeah. we have between now and May to educate everybody. And we're going to continue to have forums in here. They're not going to be a full hour, but we can come maybe 15 minutes. But who says that they can't be? Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, February is like over next week because it's a weird month and it goes by really quick. So this <laughs> will be here before we know it. We right. can't. Yeah, well, yeah, we does. can't be uh, disillusioned that it's we have time because I feel like we really need to move on this. Right. Um, but I also say, and I wasn't sure when, like, how to address the misinformation that was even presented tonight. Um, mm -hmm. It is not two. What did he say? Two point eight acres. Oh, that was wide. the mathematical calculations. Yeah, and I just felt oh. Ken, Ken Masters said two point eight mm -hmm. acres buffer zone increase town wide. That is that is not correct, and I think we need help um, putting out the information that is correct. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't, I don't know. even know that it was relevant. No, uh, it was a red herring. It was like saying, yeah, it, it was a case of taking data and making it say what you want to say. Yeah. Right. So what how do how the do figures we are right? Get but, ahead of it. Well, you ignore his math, first of all, I think, because it's not our math. Uh, no, no, but, I mean, it doesn't go to the issue. No. He had the right to say it, but it didn't make sense. No. Well, if you look at it in the grand scheme of things, it's only a 25-foot uh, increase yeah. in over the 50. So you say, okay, 25 feet. Well, this is 25 feet from me to that wall behind you. It's like, that's minimal impact for a lot of properties. If you if you have an undeveloped property, there's plenty of room to right. make that work. Right. You know, if you have a tight property on John's Pond, well, okay, it's a little different, but those are all developed properties, so you know, <coughs> the impact isn't as great, just, you know, for me reading this, you know. In, on an on a undeveloped lot, I don't think there's, there's mi very minimal or de minimis right. impact. I just yeah. think of all the plans that are all the properties that have come in front of us and when they are building or impacting the 50 to 100 foot, I mean, 
we would just be getting so much more buffer for those. Like we would be getting, we need to be able to show to people what, how this will affect them mm -hmm. and, and what it will do for us as a town. I think you're right. Maybe the top five were using so, Well, right now my mind is not, I know that it will shock you. It's not as sharp as it always is at seven in the morning. <laughs> so, but I mean, I think over the next week or so, we might be able to, and I'd certainly be willing to share by email, those top five to seven points why uh, you should not only take note of these warrants, but you, you should vote for it. You should get your fanny, you know, out of the house and down to vote. This is why it's important to you, the property values and everything that we talked about tonight. And so yeah. many oh, yes. <laughs> if we do pass this law, I, I, I agree. We have a lot of outreach to do yeah. between now and May. We have to sell our wares. Yeah. Okay. Do we need a vote on that? Are you good? Yes, I need a vote on each article. Uh, so I'll entertain a motion on the first article, which is 172.2. And uh, in your motion, would you include, first of all, if you're moving to forward this article and for which town meeting? I'll make a motion that for article, the first article, chapter 172-2, that we um, are putting it forward for May 2023. May 2023. Okay. Thank you. Is there a second to moving this forward for May? Second. Thank you, Aaron. Any discussion on that one before I call for a vote? Hearing none, Brian? Yes. Thank you. Alex? Yes. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. Charlie? No. I believe it should go to October. Okay. Thank you. And I vote yes as well. Motion carries. I'll now entertain a motion for the draft article for chapter 172.7A1. Somebody had that tonight in their discussion. They had all yeah. the letters memorized. And I everything. gave her a round of applause. But it's 172.7A1, permits, determinations, and conditions. No, no, no. You... Motion. Thank you, Brian. Second. Thank you, Aaron. And that motion is for, I'm assuming, May. Correct. OK. Any discussion on that? I'd still like to see the citizens petitioner articles because I think back to my point, you know, if we're all gonna get together and we have one shot at this, I mean, I guess talking to the other groups, like would they be willing to poll their citizens petitioner article if we put one article forward? I just feel like we're just putting multiple articles forward. Why right. reopen it? Yeah. Aren't they, wasn't there the, I thought, did I misunderstand? I thought that, they had it drafted and ready to go. If we didn't. If, e, if that, that's what I'm confused about. If the selectmen pulled, the, pulled back our article or however they maneuver it. So if we put it well, forward, the selectmen don't have to put it forward, right? Right. Yeah. What we're doing is we're moving this to the select board. Right. And then there has to be a majority vote of the select board to approve that article to put it onto the warrant. Yeah. So I mean, we should just do it anyways, it's... because the select board's going to decide whether the citizen's petition moves forward anyway. So if they, they see multiple they no, but if they turn goes, us down, if they, that's a citizen right. petition. They're that going to be in the queue. Isn't that what she said? Yeah. yeah. So if, if they, they turn our down. Down. It's if they're the don't put it forward, then, then the, the petition or article goes. Yeah, that's why I think I was trying to get us to support the citizens' petitioner article because that will definitely move forward. But I mean, I it doesn't hurt to try. So right. can we just yeah. call the vote? It's a win-win either way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I haven't seen the language on the citizens' petition, but I've been told it's identical yeah. to exactly. the figures have you seen that we it have. We'll see how the select board. Yes. Right. Yes. Well, yeah. um, it is. It had a couple of points that just weren't in there that weren't related to the one that Drew drew up. Okay. Um, oh. Um, so I do know Drew was in contact with them. Um, the discussion they had, I'm not too sure. From what I heard tonight, I would assume it went well and they are ready to back whatever happens. Why which, did, which why did Evan our... want us to do it in October? Right. He, His, he was worried about a failed vote. Yeah, he, is what he, he felt as though there was not enough time to mount a, an educational outreach to the community Who? to support it. Uh, town, town planner. planner. Oh, that's, that's, that's a good time. Yeah. 
Right. And then, but we've had that in the past where we've it's held just, it and waited and, and then no, nothing. And, it's just doesn't. and he's, he was concerned because then it would have to wait for two years before it's even touched yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's why he was concerned about it because he wants it to. He just wanted to make sure we didn't have to wait two years if something happened. When, it, when, so. when are the local officers up for election? May or October? May. In May. See, that's going to be a bigger turnout. Hmm. And have better right. opportunity and better likelihood that we're going to get passage. Yeah, the election people is... people are going to want to go anyway. Tom meeting the first and then the election. We just, need to, we just need to make sure that the people that show up are... They're very close, too. Yeah. Campaign. It's easier... <coughs> campaign. It's easier to get them off of their fannies if there's also candidates. Other things, yeah. There's all, you know... Yeah. I mean, okay. also keep in mind, we have kiosks throughout town on every single town property. I didn't know that. So if there was yeah. a flyer or anything, I could post them. Um, I could even draft a flyer... Um, with whatever information you would want on it. Um, so keep that in mind as well. That is absolutely an option when it comes to public outreach and education. We have yeah, properties all the way down from all the way to Southern Mashpee, all the way to Northern Mashpee almost. So no kidding. Yeah, keep that in mind. Please yeah. do. I've yeah, been okay. educated tonight. Yep. We'll create a flyer. Awesome. Okay, let me uh, call for a vote on this motion for 172.7A1. Brian? Yes. Thank you. Alex? Yes. Thank you. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. Charlie? No again. Okay, thank you. I vote yes as well, so motion carries. Um, one last thing, just a clean, it's more of a house cleaning thing than anything else. We have several other post uh, hearing agenda items. I would accept a motion to table these. I don't really think there's anything pressing. So moved. So Second. Moved. Yes. I didn't think. <laughs> I didn't think that would not fly. Yeah. Okay. Is there uh, anything for us to sign? Don't we have to sign? We have to sign. I'll start passing. You're all signing. Always come back first. tomorrow if you want. Um, <laughs> I'll be here. Are they coffee and donuts? <laughs> I'll be here. It's awesome. So um, let me corner. let me get a Actually, vote on yeah, those things being know. tabled. Brian? Yes. Alex? Yes. Yeah. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Thank you. I vote yes as well. And all that's left now that remains is the signing of the papers. We can do that outside of the meeting. So I would take a entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved at 9.50 p.m. Ooh. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Seconded. Thank you. Uh, Brian, you're okay with that? Yes. Thank you. Alex? Yep. Marjorie? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Steve? Yes. Charlie? Yes. And sadly, I vote yes as well. <laughs> sadly. I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> What's the record? I think you just saw it. Did we just make the record? I don't think I want to know. I don't, I don't know. think I've been to one that's... Listen, the next time I...